Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the Friday, February 16th, 2024 edition of the State Building Building Council. Can we go ahead and uh, do roll call, please? Yeah. Shell Anderson. I'm here. Jay Arnold. Here. here. Todd Byrather. Here. Justin Borgo. Here. Micah Chappelle. I am here. Damon Doyle. Here. Tom Handy. Roger Hernga. Here. Matthew Hepner. Craig Cole. Here. Ty Menzer. Ben Omara. Here. Pete Rinke. Here. Katie Sheehan. Here. Lauren Lathrop. Um, Senator John Lovett. I'm here. Representative Alex Ramel. Representative Susan Schmidt. Senator Linda Wilson. How about our Assistant Attorney General Derek Meyerbach? Okay, do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. It looks like Tom Handy is in. Gotcha. Uh, Mike has got his hand up. Uh, I was just anticipating the next item on the agenda and that I would like to move to approve the agenda with modifying where we move items five and six to after item 12 on the agenda. Uh, okay. North Moore 23. I usually have an agenda open and I didn't this time. Okay, Micah has moved that uh, items Five and six be moved to after item 12. Uh, is there a second? Shell, did you want to second or do you have a comment? Uh, I was not going to second that one. Okay. One more call for a second on that motion. Motion dies for lack of a second. Shell? Yeah, I wanted to add something to the agenda. I would like to discuss the due date for TAG applications. Um, I think a month was um, maybe too short and in order to give people that are signing up for commitments, um, serious commitments, uh, more time to apply for the TAGs. Um, I also think we've never, we've never tried to get dozens of new TAG members at once before. And I think it's, um, I think giving a little bit more time would be, would be good as well. So I'm going to, I guess we're not into motions yet, but um, when it comes time, I'll have one. Yeah, I would ask that you save that to uh, item or, or item number 13 when we start, start talking about the tags. Micah, go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't think that would be so controversial. I was just trying to move those items forward that have a lot of the work that folks are usually on here for. So if we could, could we move item five to after item 12 in the agenda? That would be my motion and then approve the agenda. Again, it's just a lot of folks are on here for the actual work um, and are not necessarily interested in the bylaw changes until we have those more complete and uh, open those up. So that was just a, a thought for the people that are on the call. Thanks. Yeah, just to clarify, there. sorry, to clarify item five and six, they're, they're connected. So the bylaws, it won't be a big discussion I, I think I just wanted to share some information because it's important for item six so if the council wants to move uh, uh, you know five five and six should go uh, in, in the same pool. okay that's is that a suggestion to Micah to amend his motion back to his original motion <laughs> That motion already failed, so I'll withdraw the motion completely. We'll disperse with those items, and sorry, folks, are on the call for other items. You're just going to have to sit through those two. Thanks. Okay. Uh, before we move on to item two and ask for approval of the agenda, 
Uh, would anybody from the uh, attendees would like to introduce themselves? If so, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands up. We've got uh, a total of 47 participants here today. So if anybody would like to introduce yourself, this is your opportunity. Uh, Bill Will. Uh, Bill Will from Wasia here. I'll be ready Thanks, to Bill. weigh in on the tags when that okay. comes up. Welcome. Anyone else? Oh, we got a hand up. Uh, Andrea. Hi, um, Andrea Smith, Billy Industry Association of Washington. Welcome. Uh, Michael. Yes, hi, uh, Michael Fear from Whatcom Million Trees Project up in Bellingham. Uh, we're here to, uh, you know, about the WUI portions as we've monitored for and, and been involved with before with you. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, anyone else care to introduce themselves? Okay, moving on. Uh, item number two. Is there a motion to uh, approve the agenda? I'll move to approve the agenda as written. Okay. Is there a second? I second. Okay, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from January 19th? I move to approve the minutes as written. I'll second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Do we want to quickly go over them? Uh, hearing no discussion, I'm going to assume everybody's read the minutes. Is there a uh, call for the question? Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Is there any public comment on items that are not on our agenda today? We have one person in the room who would like to speak. If Please you want to okay. uh, state okay. your name and then. Okay. Um, I'm Jim Warner. I'm uh, from the uh, Spokane area. And uh, I've been kind of going down a rabbit hole. Uh, primarily, I uh, in the post frame industry. I own four different businesses: uh, W two Design and Engineering, Primitive Post Systems, Solid Supply, and Solid Structures. We design and engineer post frame structures. Uh, really become, I mean, the newest, coolest house right now is Barn and Medium, right? So we've become really, really popular, you know, with that. I then manufacture a bracket that I own two patents on where you can build with no wood in the ground. And then I bring over the glue lamp columns where you see people building pole barns with no, you know, where it's uh, buried in the ground, it has treated at the bottom of it, and then it goes up to non-treated after that. I distribute that column uh, to this half of the United States on an alarm yard in Richland and in Spokane. And then I build the buildings and I own solid structures our primarily business is barn dominions, coach frame houses, and commercial projects. So what got me going down the CCA rabbit hole is I had an inspector show up to my job site. We had uh, we were building a barn dominium. I know let's say it's you know three quarters of a million dollar job. He's there to do the framing inspection, and everybody knows the framing inspection. We got our plumbing in, we got our you know our heating done, electricals done, and stuff like that. Obviously, our foundations in, you know, with the uh, brackets, foam, everything like that. He looked at the column. I'm using that glue lamp column that, you know, I distribute over and looks at the column and goes, is that CCA treatment there? And I go, yeah. And at this time I'm, you know, uneducated. You know, I've been, been doing this since, you know, 1998. Nobody's ever questioned me about the CCA treatment, right? I always thought, oh, your egg exempt or glue lamp column exempt, whatever it is, there's some, gotta be some type of exemption. You know, and he goes, oh, I didn't think you could do that. And he kind of moves on, passes my framing. And we just keep on building along. So I started to go down the rabbit hole of why did he ask that question? You know, makes me a little bit nervous. 
So I'm researching CCA treatment and UC4B, you know, construction. First thing that pops up, 2003, you know, EPA and, uh, you know, treatment companies come to an agreement. CCA treatment won't be used anymore, basically. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's interesting. You know, and it talks about homeowner uses and then it goes into playground equipment, you know, and stuff like that. So then I, you know, start researching some more, you know, things. Why aren't home builders using it? They used to put that green tree to call them and wrap it with smart trimmer, concrete board or cedar, and all of a sudden they stopped using it. And then I got to thinking, I was like, when I brought these columns over, I tried to go to par lumber, thinking this would be a, you know, it's a perfectly glue lamp column they could stick in the ground and treat it up. I'm like, I'm going to kill it with sales on it. So I go to par lumber and, and stuff, and they're like, no, no, we can't sell that in the residential market. I'm like, what? That's interesting. So I just kind of keep carrying on, right, with my, you know, with my life until this inspector shows up. So then I realized, you know, Home Depot doesn't have CCA treatment. Lowe's doesn't have CCA treatment in it. So then I, you know, I keep researching and I try to get a hold of EPA for clarification. Um, numerous people until I uh, got in contact with Dustin, you know, on what is it allowed for, you know. So finally, I'm at uh, now at this stage in the game with EPA, you know, on it. And I'm working with a, a gal named uh, Chris. She's out of uh, District 8. She's going to be working with some people in 10. And it really made me start to think, why is it banned? So I started researching it. I got the newest document from 2023, and it has pages and pages of, you know, requirements. If you're going to treat it, you're going to handle it, you know, everything that these treatment companies have to do. Um, and I'm looking at it, reading through it, and I'm going, oh, my gosh. Now, once it leaves the yard, right, nobody cares. You know, so here I am. I've been, like I said, I've been doing it since 1998. I'm a desk jockey now but through that time you know before you know i used to take that dripping wet cca three to call grab it throw it on my shoulder stand it up in there and pour concrete paint. you know i'm sure we all probably done that right you know with it not knowing that it's arsenic you know i get up on there you know you do a 60 by 100 i get up there with the chainsaw and i'm notching in the poles with all that treatment gable ends i'm notching them down 10 feet sometimes i mean you're anywhere from six to 12 hours on a job up there with ski goggles on no mask breathing arsenic you know and i'm and you know all the time i didn't know that you know i just well it's okay you know they're shipping it to me so it can't be really that bad for me you know on it so i really start going down this rabbit hole at that time you know once i start really thinking about it that it's like man i've been sending this and people are still sending it you know, out to all these people and all these, you know, uh, contractors in the post frame industry. And we're kind of really not regulated. We're kind of regulated. We're, you know, we, we commercial dirt things. We don't really fall underneath the energy code. We, you know, they, they just kind of look at us and they just, oh, it's a barn. Or then people go in there and they finish them off and, you know, they're living in them now. You know, like right now, I got a $1.5 million barn of medium going. You know, we're going to be doing a $2 million commercial project, you know, with it. You know, really, should they be used with the CCA? And are they allowed? And when are they allowed? And that's kind of what Dustin and I started. You know, we had a, a pretty good conversation for 30, 40 minutes or whatever about when they are allowed. When is UC4B? When does that fall into? So that's really what I'm trying to get, you know, to is, is where where can it be used and where it can't can it be used because the last thing that I want to do is have a structure up the whole entire thing frame sided roofed windows in it ready to put insulation in and the inspector come in and go you can't have that and then I got to tear it down I got a half a million dollars in it I mean it's bankrupt so at that stage in the game you know that's where I'm looking from you know code places you know from you guys you know being in the state of Washington my primary you know, work, we do some in Oregon, we do some in Montana and Idaho. What, what does that look like? You know, from what I can tell is, is that UC4B is permanent foundation, right? That it's good for that. Is it okay for wall framing? Once it leaves the foundation and it goes up, is it okay for that? Is it okay for truss supports? Does it have to transition out of it? 
you know, you have the, the solid sawn poles that are treated all the way up. You got nail lamps that are only treated for the UC4B product, you know, part of it. And then it goes to non-treated after that. So you're really never cutting it, you know, you're, but it is still, you know, the CCA is down in there, um, in the ground. So, and then you have products like a permacol, concrete, you know, column, uh, you know, that goes into ground and then a wood column gets set on top of it. Still, the majority of those columns that are going on top of it are CCA treated at the bottom. So is that now considered wall framing? And it's not part of the permanent foundation that is, you know, okay. So when it comes up onto a bracket, does it have to be non-treated? Um, deck supports, you know, why are the home builders aren't allowed to use it, but I'm using it in my house. Am I exempt? Am I not exempt? You know, so I'm just trying to look for some clarification, not just for me, but for the industry that, you know, where we can use this, what does UC4 be qualified as a qualified moving into that wall section? Or does it, you know, when we set it on a foundation wall, can we set a treated pole on that? Is that okay? Are we egg exempt or not egg exempt? You know, where are we at on that? And I, like I said, I'm, I'm talking to EPA, I'm asking them the same questions. And it kind of seems like there's really no answer at this stage in the game that I have that's definite. I have my opinion. Um, but that's really all it is until, you know, you guys, EPA, every different jurisdiction kind of comes in and says, no, this is how the EPA rule is, is that it's UC4B. When it goes on the wall, it can't be treated. Or, no, we don't really care. Carry on, Jen. You know, you know, we don't care about the RC. You know, it's fine. So that's what I'm here. I'm uh, not looking for a decision today, obviously, but I do want to bring it you know, I want to bring it to people's radar. Um, I didn't know where else to, you know, bring it outside of, you know, at least started getting some conversations. And, you know, I guess we got 47 people on here listening to me ramble on. So I'll uh, leave it open for comments or questions or, you know, go from there. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, I you know, immediately pulled up the EPA website. One of the first things it says is that in December of 03, uh, chromated and arsen arsenic manufacturers voluntarily discontinued manufacturing those uh, products for homeowner uses, but it sounds like they're still out there. Um, I know Todd probably has definitely some information on this. Um, I don't know that there's really anything this body can do. Uh, we do leave some latitude to the local jurisdictions, local building officials to make certain calls. So in some areas, they may decide you can't have it. This is one of the reasons that... Uh, Simpson Hardware rolled out all their Z-Max fasteners was to be able to be used with the uh, UC4B. So, uh, Todd, you got? Can you weigh in on this a little bit? Well, um, a little bit. I had I do have some experience with it, but Jim, thank you for for raising this, and thank you for for going to Olympia in person. I think it is an important topic, and you raised some questions that I I I don't personally have have the answers to. So, well, the question I have for you is when. Um, you know, in this trend, and I've seen this also as as we're starting to occupy these these structures um, for residencies, are local jurisdictions permitting those under the IRC, the residential code, in your experience? Yeah, there we we go through the same uh, code compliance, you know, and everything like that. Our structures have to be, you know, fully engineered. There's not like a a set building code on them. So it's a, up to each person to get their own engineering. Some jurisdictions have some boilerplate, uh, small building engineering, but the I would say 90% of them all have to be specifically designed, engineered, stamped, and then, you know, from there. And that's, you know, like I said, that's that's where a lot of my concern is, you know, if I'm just looking at it from a selfish standpoint, you know, if something turns sideways, I don't get sued because I built it. I get sued because I built it, I supplied it, I distributed it, and I designed and engineered it. So I, it's a pretty big deal to me. So to to come up with some type of question, you know, answer. Okay. Well, thank you. And then that's the the you know, I'm not a residential code expert, but that that's the question I have for the council is to better educate all of us on 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 those types of foundations in in the residential code. So thank you. Thanks, Todd. Roger. Yeah, I just, uh, I agree with Todd. It, it, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Um, 
And there's a whole lot of questions I have about uh, is it is it enforcement of the code, which is not necessarily this body? Is it um, is it you know I would want to know does the code say foundations have to be treated, and do we specify exactly what that treatment is allowed? So. In order for me to really make an opinion, I would need to do some digging, but I think it's a very um, a very good topic for us to look at at some point. And um, and I, you know, I don't want to pass the buck either. It sounds like an important <laughs> topic, but um, you know, for today to respond, I think that there there are some questions as to what we can do, but I think this body should take a look at it and you know try to do what we can um, at a at a future meeting. So. But to wrap back, um, my my interpretation is is that you know I think it's black and white, right? If it's sitting on a foundation and there's a bracket, and then it goes from that bracket out of that bracket. It's obviously not UC four B then because there's no there's no wood in the ground. It's it's a hundred percent wall framing. So my interpretation is is that you know that really shouldn't be, you know, treated because it's not part of the foundation. It's part of a wall framing at that, at that stage in the game. Um, then, you know, so that's where, you know, a lot of the higher end barn dominiums are getting built is with that no wood in the ground. Um, and that's, that's becoming more and more popular with uh, Simpson has a small line of uh, brackets out there. We have our bracket. Uh, Permacolum has uh, three different sets of brackets out there that you can buy and build with. You know, a residential house with no treated, with no wood in the ground, with anything like that. So that there is products out there that uh, solves this problem, and it it isn't as Thanks. you know, if you're going to build a pole barn, it has to be treated. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out what steps that this group can take, and I'm I'm wondering if there is a code interpretation that we could, um, you know, there uh, I'm forgetting the right the right process, but if there is a, we do have a process where you ask us for code interpretations. And if there's a code interpretation that you could propose to us and we could consider it and, um, you know, we, as a group, we would try to figure out if that's something that we could, what what uh, decision we could make on that code interpretation, um, that might be a path forward to clarifying it. Okay, so I can put that together, kind of detail it out where people can read through it. Just to clarify the process, uh, the council opinion can be requested by uh, uh, building and fire officials. Only. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. and I, I guess, uh, you know, as a home builder, I, I thought that, that this material had been banned 20 years ago. I'm kind of surprised that it's still available. Um, Jim, I, I don't know if you recall, you and I have talked, I used to work for a, a, a builder that built all over the state in Idaho, and we've mm -hmm. used that, your uh, PPS system on multiple projects. So oh, and that, the, reason, the reason I did that was because I don't like burying wood, you know, regardless of what it's treated with. So mm -hmm. thank you for coming up with that. Uh, Mike, yeah. go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, we probably could provide an interpretation if one came through a code official, however, it would be on model code. So section R402.1.2 is wood treatment for wood foundations in the residential code, which I believe this would fall under. So again, that it would be an ICC interpretation, which is a possible place for the individual to start is looking at the ICC website and see if they have an interpretation on this section. They do have code commentary, of course, and it does point to a, a, um, AWPAU1 requirement for these treatments. So um, again, there is something in the codes currently on this and it would be an ICC interpretation to start. Um, and again, we have in the past, I know we have talked about doing ICC interpretations, but we, we try not to at least to steer the uh, individual there first. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm on the AWPA website. There is a ton of information for building code officials on treatments. Um, so that that is a resource. And again, I think this is a national issue, not a local issue or state issue. Todd? Yeah, and I was going to, you know, raise to the council, again, not knowing if, if these types of foundations are in the in the IRC. I assume they're not. Um, 
but I think Jim made a point here where they're not being embedded in the ground when they're applied in the residential. But I would I like to understand that pathway better and whether we advise, you know, Jim and others to um, make a proposal to the IRC since we're in or the IBC since we're in in the cycle. So maybe maybe sharing that information. I'm sure, Dustin, you are already. So thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, no further comments, Jim. Thank you for bringing this information forward. I think this is valuable. Are there any other public comments for items that are not on the agenda? Uh, hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item five. Changes to the SBCC bylaws. Stoyan, you want to lead us off on this? Yes, I will share the document in the screen. And uh, I will start with uh, the technical advisory group. So what you see here is what was approved by the council for the 2024 code adoption cycle. Uh, the council may or may not add this to the uh, bylaws. Why I have this here and we don't need a vote today, again, based on the council decision, but this is the important part, the residential and the woody parts, because uh, we, have issues with the WE code. And in addition, we have uh, Senate Bill 6120, mm -hmm. whatever the number was, that will uh, leave the council without any authority on the WE code. So the question here is, shall we keep residential and WE codes in the same technical advisory group? And here is the important part. This is part of the bylaws already we have BFP committee and we have uh, uh, MVE committee. But because we have the plumbing mechanic and ventilation technical advisory group, so this will require some changes to the uh, names of the committees. Again, the council may vote or may not today. It's not that important, but I wanted to let you know that there will be some changes because when we get to the next agenda item, this will be, uh, the vote will be needed for filling up the uh, standing uh, committees. So mm -hmm. if we have residential and we call technical advisory group, group, the name will still stay the same, but uh, here we will have one position. If we have a residential tag and we tag if the, again, the council decides to change this, then we will have one uh, chair for the residential and one chair for the we code. So that will change the numbers only, not the name. So mm -hmm. if you want to discuss and vote on uh, article three, uh, the first part for the names of the committees, uh, it will be great. If you don't, we'll keep it for March, but the council needs to take into consideration the, the different names when we get to the next agenda. Okay, uh, and I'll, I'll just remind everybody, uh, 6120 did pass the Senate. Uh, it's in the House now. It's scheduled for hearing on the 20th and executive session on the 21st. It's uh, unusual for them to schedule a hearing and an exec session back to back, so I think the inclination is that that uh, is likely to pass, which is likely to put a 18 to 24 month delay on implementation of the WUI. Um, so perhaps it is wise to break that out. Uh, Chell, you got the thoughts? Yeah, I was going to make a motion to approve the bylaws changes as suggested and on the screen. Uh, can you scroll down a little bit, starting on the technical advisory groups? So you you want to keep the WUI and residential together as we decided previously? Yes. Okay. This is Todd. I'll I'll second that. Okay. There's a motion and a second to approve the changes as displayed. Um, so then we would have the uh, the we would have the BFP. Uh, excuse me. It would become the BFRW. And we'd have the MVE P, is that correct? Or PMVE? PMVE. Okay. And, um, and just to clarify uh, that for changes to the bylaws, we need two thirds. 
uh, of all. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I, I guess, Joe, maybe maybe you're aware, but I'm, I don't think there is a separate standing committee for plumbing previously. So I'm wondering if that discussion had taken place within the MVE committee, if there's anything that um, came out of the plumbing tag um, for that discussion. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's a need to change that MVE name, uh, if it already had included the plumbing uh, discussion. The plumbing previously was for 2021 code adoption cycle, the plumbing had its own technical advisory group and uh, it was part, the, the chair of the technical advisory group was a member of the BFP committee, building fire BFP. and plumbing. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I guess, yeah, I guess clarifying that we're, we're now pushing that plumbing and really it's going to be the, the plumbing mechanical ventilation tag chair as part of the MBE committee or now the PMBE committee. So I, I don't have an objection to that. So okay. that seems fine. Micah. Hey, thanks for making the motion, Shell. I, I do think we should keep the WUI code tag as part of the residential tag and keep it in the bylaws. Part of the legislation is an adoption of chapter one, and there may be modifications to that. In addition, the legislation will allow jurisdictions to adopt the WUI code in whole or portions thereof. And any changes to that WUI code at that point would need to come through the State Building Code Council for approval as part of another RCW. So to have a WUI code tag or members of that tag that have expertise to maybe provide input on those changes proposed by jurisdictions or input on that change to chapter one as required by the legislation would be beneficial. So I agree that we should uh, pass it with the WUI code included. Thanks. Thank you. Roger. Yeah, I, uh, I want to keep reminding us that we uh, have a schedule and our schedule for the next code cycle uh, there's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of talk about needing to move as quickly as we can so that we aren't pushing things out to the end and we can adopt it when we want to adopt it. So we did a lot of work uh, coming up with these. I don't see a big reason that we would change it. So I'm going to support this. I would just entertain one editorial friendly amendment, if I may. I would like to refer to it as the MVPE just because people refer to it, it rolls off the tongue a whole lot better than PMBE. And people have already, as we've talked about it, had difficulties saying it. So MVP is something that we talk about all the time. So MVPE might be something that we could uh, remember more easily. So I, like I don't know. It. MVP, okay. that's friendly. I'll, uh, I think that's a good, <clears throat> good change. Thanks. Okay. Uh, ben? Yeah, and then I, I guess along. So I guess we'd also change the it tag. in the, in the yeah. list at the bottom. Yeah, for the, the tag name as well, Joe. Okay. That's what you're thinking. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Okay. Uh, any, any further comments on this? Uh, the mechanical ventilation and plumbing, is this? Yes, mechanical ventilation and plumbing. And now we have to decide if we're going to put an Oxford comma or not. <laughs> oh, an interview. Oh, no, we got it. It's the MVAP. Okay. Um, if you could uh, zoom out just a little bit so maybe we can see the whole, whole motion on the screen. A little slide bar down in the corner. There you go. Okay. So the motion is to adopt these standing committees and the following six tags. Uh, seeing no hands up, no further discussion. Uh, again, this is a uh, bylaw change and therefore requires a two thirds vote. So, Chell, go ahead. Is there a public comment on this? I can't remember. Yes. This oh, is what I, I, yes. Thank you. I did not yeah, I appreciate that. And I see that uh, Dave Colcott's got his hand up. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you. I was just going to make that point that uh, public comment was noted in the agenda for this. I oppose combining the residential WUI tag as one group. That tag is not uh, configured enough to be able to handle the requirements of the WUI code. 
I think the council needs to understand that there are sections of the filling code and the fire code that apply to this. The original WUI code was under the fire tag originally as part of as an appendices to this. I see this, we're just creating a problem with this. You guys set up the arrangement of the residential tag and it is not set up to be able to handle the WUI code at this point. So I do not uh, recommend that the council move forward with this. Okay, thank you, Dave. Any other comments from the public or the council? Uh, hearing none, we'll take a roll call vote as this does take a super majority. Shell Anderson? Uh, yes. Jay Arnold? Yes. Todd Bayruther? Aye. Justin Borgo? Aye. Micah Chappelle? Micah? Damon Doy? Oh, Tom Handy? Aye. Roger Hingry? Haringa? Yes. Craig Holt? Yes. Ty Menser? Yes. Ben O'Mara? Yes. Pete Ricky? Yes. Katie Sheehan? Yes. What does it? Fred Mike again. Yeah, Mike Chappelle? Do I see yes. anything on it? Okay. Oh. Well, that's good to know. Is that unanimous? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Um, is that complete item five, Stoyan? Yes. Okay. Uh, item number six, appointment of council members to tags and standing committees. Let's, uh, we'll start with standing committees if we may. And, uh, uh well, to start with this, we need, we need, uh, first we need council members for the technical advice. So again, we can do it now, which is a better option, but it's not, uh, fatal if we can if we can do it uh, in March. So it's it's up to the council. So okay. I have everything I have everything ready. If you want to go through this, we, we can do it now. Let's let's make an attempt. And, and recall at the last meeting, um, Roger had suggested that or we 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 passed a motion to have two tag member two council members per tag, one being a uh, a, a vice tag or vice council member. That's not the right word. Not a voting member if the primary member is present. And with six tags and 15 council members, I'd like to see, you know, no duplication. Everybody spread out and we get we get 12 members on, on our six tags. And then ideally the remaining three would be our, our committee chairs. Um, I want to see if we can avoid such a situation where uh, the chair of a tag points to a committee that he also chairs so that or he or she rather um, so that the council or the committee level is a check and balance so to speak so if we could start here we can go through the building code tag um, Todd are you interested in chairing this committee again or this so this right? is uh, you see the name sorry sorry to cut you off uh, you see the names here uh, uh, stay war for 2021 uh, okay. and We've also got a policy that uh, nobody remains on a tag for more than two cycles. Is that correct? It's still in the bylaws, yes. Okay. So, Todd, is this your, was that your first cycle on the Billy Code tag? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that policy. <laughs> uh, um, do, do we have the historical information for that, Stoyan? Uh, uh, I, I, well, it's been, it's been in the bylaws for, for how many years? But no, I understand that. Time. Oh, so yeah, yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not questioning the, the policy. Uh, well, I I don't know because I wasn't here for 2018. So, you know. Uh, were, you, you don't recall if you were on the tag the previous code cycle? Oh, code cycle. Not code year. Cycle. Oh, no, no. Not not code cycles. Okay. So, you you were just on for the 2021. Correct. Correct. Okay. Are you interested in continuing as chair of this tag? I am if it's the will of the council and knowing that this is my last year, so um, someone else would be ready to take it over next year. Okay. Uh, Roger, I see you there as, the, as a second person. Are you interested in remaining in that position? 
Uh, I am uh, both interested and I think with my possession represent, position representing the structural engineering community, I should be on the building, building code tag. Okay. And um, I'm fine being the vice chair and figuring once Todd leaves, I would step in and fill his humongous shoes. So <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know that we need to go through and vote on all of these individually. Um, I, I would like to continue discussion on the other five tags and then vote on them as, as a group if everybody's in agreement with that. Anybody opposed to that idea? Okay, let's uh, move on to the next tag then, please. Fire code tag, it was uh, Tony and Roger. Tony is no longer a council member. Uh... Todd, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And just to elaborate on that, I think it is important when we talk about each tag that knowing that this year is the year on most of these that we're bringing in proposals and there needs to be a smooth transition as we move into the next cycle as as we're in the middle of of the code cycle. So just as as long as we have a plan is 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 kind of my um, interest. And do we Stan, do have we uh do we have a, an appointment from the fire community yet? It's the governor's office. No, we we don't. We don't have uh, uh, an appointment yet. Uh, I I know uh, who was nominated, but that's all I know. Okay, Roger, you have a comment? Yeah, I just also want to, you know, make sure um, that council members that do represent particular. Uh, interest groups like the the fire code tag should include the um whoever is going to replace tony's position so i mean that just makes sense because they're the technical expert on the council so um and then i was just going to say i volunteered to be on that committee purely because the uh question about um mass timber um i don't have any concern whatsoever stepping back and letting somebody else from the council beyond the fire code tag okay and that would go in hand in hand with uh trying to spread this out and get as many council members on these tags as possible um chell yeah i guess just speaking slightly against against that um or your suggestion i think we want to spread it out but we also want to have the right people on the leading the tags and um so I guess I'm not opposed to uh, Roger being on two tags in one of the two primary or alternate positions. I think that is not not a, not a bad way to go. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, how soon does this tag need to meet, Stoyan? Uh, oh, the technical advisory groups have not established yet. So, uh, and I don't think we'll be able to we can fill the position in March because uh, I don't think we'll have all seats uh, filled before March. Okay. Um, is anybody opposed to leaving it as it is until March? Uh, and and if, the, if, if by March we still don't have a representative and we need to meet, Roger could chair the tag. So, okay, here, seeing no hands up, uh, let's go on to the next one. Energy code commercial, it's a chill currently as a chair, and we don't have a second. Uh, I, I would volunteer to take the second on the energy code commercial. Who is that? Craig. Craig, Craig. okay. Uh, Chell, has this, have you been here for two cycles on the energy code? No, I've. I mean, council members generally are only appointed for a couple of cycles, and I um, was appointed to take over for, for Dwayne midway through the 2018 mm -hmm. cycle. Um, but no, I have not served on there for two full code cycles. Okay, so you, you got one and a half, because I, I did recall you being part of the 18. Uh, Todd? I guess I'll have to look that that policy up because it, it doesn't make sense because we are we only are appointed to the maximum of two three-year terms right so is that uh 
I'm just curious if something seems out of alignment there. My understanding on that is uh, that I think it was the governor's decision to limit people to two full terms and not a statutory limitation is my understanding. And that's that's my recollection of, as well. Yes. What I've, what I've learned. Can, I, can I jump in for a second here? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that, but also note that it is, of course, possible for someone to be a member of the TAG and not a member of the, the council, too. So if somebody was a TAG member but not a council member for a full code cycle and then uh, comes in as a council member, that that limitation, if correct me if I'm wrong, would still would still mm -hmm. should still apply. Joe, go ahead. I guess I would suggest that if we make a decision on that as a council, and I don't know that we have, but if we do, that if someone is on the tag but not a council member, that that would count differently than someone, than if they become a council member later or were formerly a council member, because it's a different role when you serve as a technical expert versus a convening chair of a, of a council. Okay. Uh, Shall I guess I should ask, are you interested in being chair of this tag again? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I feel like that's, yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I will uh, remind everyone that this is open to public comment as well. So if any of the attendees uh, want to weigh in, feel free to raise your hand. I've got the little screen open. So this is the energy code residential tag. Uh, we're not ready with the seats and the residential code uh, tag yet, but uh, it's good if we have the council members. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have Chell as a chair and Damon uh, was uh, uh, the second council member. Um, Chell, since your name's there, are you interested in doing this again as well? Yes, I, I, I like the abuse. Yeah, I like the abuse. You're a glutton for punishment. Is there is there anyone else who's interested in this position? Okay, uh, seeing none, we will leave it as is for now. So th this one is a little bit more complicated. So Micah was the tag chair of the residential board, and Damon was the council member uh, that was a TAC member as well. Tony was a TAC chair for the WECO. Tony is no longer a council member. And Pete Ricky was the uh, council member that was also uh, a technical advisor group member for the WECO. So um, let's, let's remove Tony. And uh, since I'm both council chair and on the uh, uh, residential energy, I would pull myself out of this committee as well for this tag. So are you are you suggesting we have four council members because we combine the two tags? No, uh, this is what we have. And I was, I was uh, going to ask Micah, uh, because Micah didn't uh, reapply for uh, council membership if he wants to stay here. But there, there should be a decision. There should be uh, two people in the in the WE. I think. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, the, the bylaws do require that the chair be a, a council member. Yes. So, uh, Todd? So despite, you know, the fact that I voted and I do support having the, the residential and the WE together i think dave cocott's you know comments are valid and we should craft this if we can to have some some mechanism that pulls together the fire and the wooey so if that means that one member serves on both that'd be relevant i think the same is between the ibc and the if you know the fire you know code if, if somebody can really pull us together since we do frequently have joint you know meetings i think that would be valuable yeah, and remember, this is this is simply the voting members of the tag. This doesn't preclude uh, input from other uh, subject matter experts. Correct. And just to just to follow up um, or raise a question, we, what did we decide on the move towards a consistency 
you know, committee or, or so forth that would also provide that mechanism. Did we at the in, in the standing committees? We, I believe, only addressed the tags where we limited the tag membership to 15 voting members. Um, we haven't done anything on the committees as of yet, my recollection. We're not moving forward on a consistency committee or mechanism. Is that everyone remember what I'm talking about? Can you elaborate? Yeah, I, I don't. Okay. Once the we get code, through, code coordination committee or oh oh am I am I I'm sorry if I'm calling it the wrong thing a coordination committee the 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 decision the decision was uh, that the standing committees uh, will do the coordination okay okay without a separate committee and then later time this can be established uh, uh, as well yeah, yeah. We, I, we, I recall, we have thank you for the reminder. Yeah, we did. I, I recall the discussion now. We did not come to any conclusion on creating that committee. Micah? Yeah, I, I'm I'm good with having joint meetings as necessary, depending on the topic with either the fire tag or, or others. Uh, I think we've done that in the past many times. I'd be happy to stay on for now until I'm replaced. We have made a recommendation to the governor's office for a replacement. Um, however, that has not gone forward yet. So I'd be happy to stay on the tag until then. And once that member is uh, seated, then we can go from there. Uh, the only question I have, though, <laughs> is if I'm not going to be a council member, I would like to at least um, become a tag member after I'm done. I guess the question was, will I be able to do that <laughs> uh, if I'm shown as the chair between now and, I don't know, 10 days when the application period is done? Just curiosity, thanks. Um, we have not assigned the seat yet for the residential and WUI codes. Um, certainly when we get to that portion of the agenda, we could um, we could appoint 14 and leave a spot open for you or have a, you know, a duplication on the building official. I think that that's, you know, we, we need as many code users on these groups as possible. And so certainly, you know, builders, engineers, and inspect you know building officials. I think are critical. Uh, sure. Craig? And if I'm not appointed, I won't. Uh, I'll still participate. So it's not the end okay. of the world. Yep. Craig. So my question kind of goes to what you alluded to previously. Uh, was I? You know, while Mike is the expert, and I, I think he's the perfect person to be chair. I don't think he's eligible to be chair of this tank, even though we're going to replace because we're going to replace him. He's currently technically only a member of the council. And I don't know that it's wise to have a temporary chair, and, but I certainly endorse keeping him on the tag. I just don't know if it's by the bylaws. We can't have somebody who is tech, you know, gonna be gone in three weeks or four weeks as the chair at this point, since we have a lot of business to do. And I, I, I think we should consider getting someone else there as chair and keeping Micah there as part of the tag as long as we can. That was it. And, and I'll, I'll ask the same question I asked regarding fire. When is this tag going to need to meet first, Stoyan? Uh, not earlier than August. Then, uh, but but uh, again, remember that we have we have a, a, a bill that is going through that. So what I'm saying now may change tomorrow. But the plan, the plan was because the residential and the we is in group two. Well, we is not yet, but we will talk about the we code in, in a different agenda item. Uh, but uh, it wasn't planned to have a tag meeting in the next couple of months. Okay, Pete. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, while I have a keen interest in this subject matter. Uh, my expertise level is not really up to being the primary council member on, on this tag. And so it, when and if Micah goes away, it, I can't rise to that position effectively. So I just wanted to, you'll have to find somebody else, but I'm willing to be secondary if that's appropriate. Okay. And, and, and again, I'll remind people that you're not necessarily needing to be a subject matter expert to be the chair of the tag. Um, you know, somebody, somebody that can run a meeting. That's probably the primary prerequisite. Not um, sure I can do that either. I, I suspect I can, but I... <laughs> I think you do just fine. Um, 
Okay, so am I hearing a consensus to uh, keep it as is for now, knowing that we will likely replace the tag chair with the incoming building official representative? Did I summarize the thoughts of the group? Can I get some nods, maybe? Okay, hey, well, thanks. thanks, Jay. This is plumbing mechanical and ventilation. And again, uh, Mike was the plumbing code technical advisor group chair. Uh, Justin was the mechanical code uh, technical advisor group chair. Okay. Uh, Pete, did you still have a comment? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Ben, go ahead. Uh, I would be happy to um, chair this committee or act as the um, the vice chair or alternate. Wonderful. Let's arm wrestle for it. <laughs> so, yeah. And I don't think just... I was chair on that. I think uh, we put it down there for the 2021 because we didn't have your position filled for plumbing at the moment. But I, I was not that person last code cycle. Thanks. Okay. So uh, you want to uh, put insert Ben as the tag chair for her? And yeah, for, uh, yeah and I'll, I'll like Justin. Feel free to indicate if you you would like to continue as chair as well, and we can you know, have more discussion if needed. I like but, the arm wrestle for it method. I think that's fun. <laughs> I, it's 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 all right. I could be back up on that too. Either way, is it possible since both? Well, I guess both tags are. Now meeting in group one. Uh, you mean the if you you know between group one and group two, just swap chairs. Uh, well, plumbing is in group two, isn't it? Is it I believe we oh, moved it into group one previously. Let me double check. Uh, uh, so mechanical code is in group one and the plumbing code is in group two. So switching chairs for both groups ability will work, will work if this is there. What do you think, Ben? My, my understanding is we moved the plumbing into group one in a previous meeting. Just due to, due to aligning them with for this tag. We will double check that. Okay. And our, our, our groups are based upon how ICC releases the model codes. Is that correct? Uh, we couldn't align this time with ICC because ICC changed change the schedule. Uh, and uh, we put the residential and the edge code in group two because we won't have the model codes available before May, was it? May or June. May or June. So May this June. Was in group. Wow. Uh, and uh, the we code is in group one, but we want to ask the council to move the we code to group two for okay. many, many reasons. Okay, Todd? If that is the case, if plumbing's in two, I would support Krista's recommendation because this is an annual process that we set these. Is that correct? So we can yes. use them next year. I believe so. Okay. Craig, I saw your hand up at one point. Did you have a comment? No, I, you guys answered it. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's continue on. Okay. Uh, the building fire residential and we codes committee shall include the council chair and chairs of the building code tag, fire code tag, and the residential, residential and we code tag. So we have Damon is the council chair, and then uh, the building court tag is Todd Berutter, is the chair here. Uh, residential and we tag chair, uh, we put Micah temporary, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, what I'm missing, the fire court tag, we left it open. Building fire residential and we. And currently we have Damon as a council member, but Damon will be 
a member as the council chair. So we will remove Damon from here. Uh, and then we have Craig Holt and Roger Herring, uh, also a members of this committee as uh, council members. Again, Micah is currently the chair, but it's up to the council. And Micah, of course, uh, if uh, we'll keep we'll keep Micah there. So the council chair here is not automatically the chair. Okay, sorry about that. I had a distraction. Uh, Todd, go ahead. You had a comment. Well, if if it's appropriate, I would um, like to make an argument or nominate Roger to be the chair, so that there's continuation. Uh, if 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 Roger were willing to take over the building code next year, and again, the building code is important because it, it it's one that spans both groups, and so and since Roger is the alternate or the on both the fire and the building, I would like to make that argument if he's willing. Okay, uh, uh, Chell. Uh, well, hold on. Before I call on Chell, Roger, is that okay with you? Or you uh, can can I just? I was a little distracted too. Can I make sure I know what committee I'm being volunteered for? Building fire residential and weak codes committee. Okay, that that's the standing committee, right? Yes, that's okay. the standing. Committee. Yeah, I would be willing to do that. Wonderful. Okay, Chell, comment. Yeah, my comment is <clears throat> if if Micah goes off the council in I don't know, say thirty days or whatever it is. I want to make sure we have at least five other members on the committee because otherwise we have a quorum with only two people, meaning if those two people ever talk to each other, we it has to be an open public meeting, even if they just email each other. Yeah. So we should have at least five members plus Micah since Micah is a short timer. That's a good observation. Micah, comment? Yeah, I, I agree with Chell on that. Um, but I did want to point out, I think Todd mentioned that the building code would span two, or maybe this is the committee. Never mind. Ignore my comment. We did not split the structural out as we should to align with ICC, but uh, we'll we get still there. have chapter seven, though, right? Um, yeah, we'll have stuff. This, this committee will span both years, uh, but the building code won't. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight. We cannot have more than seven. Uh, you can get rid of the random council. I have here. Micah twice. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. We have seven. One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And yeah. I will I'll clean up the table and make it look better for the next game. Okay. And are we uh, are we keeping that spot open for a random council member? Uh, the, That's... Well, we don't really have all right now. So we will have the fire. Micah is the residential and we tech chair. Uh, we have one council member available here. Okay. Um, can I get a volunteer for that spot? Tom? Yeah, I'd, I'd volunteer for that. Thank you. Okay, any other comments on this standing committee? Okay. Oh, go ahead, Jill. Who is the who is the proposed chair of the committee? Roger. Uh, Roger. I believe I believe chair appointments uh are under the purview of the chair with the consensus of the committee, and I would certainly support Roger to chair this committee. Uh Jill, did you have another comment? No, I guess I I guess we usually choose a chair right now. So I guess and, yes. and I have Roger being the chair. So that sounds good. Okay. Okay. Uh this will be mechanical. MVPE. MV. What was that? MVPE? MVPE. Uh -huh. 
most, most valuable player. Okay. Uh, currently, we have Chill, Energy Contact. Uh, well, that's interesting because Chill. It's he's a uh, uh, he's chair for two Energy Contact technical advisor groups. That's why. Uh, we have we have Justin, uh, who was the mechanical contact chair. Uh, and it's now Ben. It's now, it's now Ben. No, oh, it's, it's not. Heavy. E. Yeah, that's that's yeah, it. Take right. off the E. Yeah, that's correct. Justin MVP. Justin for MVP. <laughs> ben for MVP. Yeah. I should have asked Rosanna to do that. <laughs> ED. We're entertaining this way. Okay, we have. Plumbing mechanical ventilation and edge. Uh, the council chair, the, the council chair is here. Yep, you Chairs got it. of the plumbing mechanical ventilation tag, we have Ben. Uh, residential energy call tag, we have chair. And the commercial energy tag, and we have chair. Uh, uh, chill, sorry. <laughs> and we have council members, Jay, Tolberator, Pete Ricky, and uh, uh, Katie. Yeah. Anybody want to want to get off of that so I can get onto that one? Yeah. So I was, I was going to say, if I may, Chair, um, my my membership on this committee predated moving into the chair of the of the IBC, which then put me into the BFP also. So I'd like to be removed. And I think we also discussed at the last council meeting, except for the chair, that we our preference is to not have council members on both standing committees. Correct. So please remove me. Okay. So go ahead and pull Todd off, please. I will gladly volunteer. Support. Okay. Who was that? Justin. Justin. Yes. Okay. Okay. And there's uh seven members. Uh oh, let, wait, let's go back. Let's determine uh um I would prefer to see a chair that's not a chair of a tag, just as we did in the previous committee. Uh, Jay, do you have a comment? I was just going to volunteer to be chair because of that issue, given the number of uh, tag, tag chairs we have on this committee. Okay, I, I would support that. Shell, are you are you okay with that? Does it hurt your feelings? My feelings are not hurt. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. Okay, the Lynch Committee. So Jay is on as, as chair of the committee. Um, so council officers, which is the chair and, and the vice chair, chairs of the standing committees and other voting members of the council. Okay. okay. So we have Ted, Todd Beirutor is the vice chair, yeah. Damon is the chair, uh and uh you got roger chair of rogers chair yep yeah i'll change the titles like that and i could switch with jay on on the the title okay as a former chair. yes Okay. So here we have seven, and Representative Ramo, he's not here, but he's also ex-official member, and we used to have 
eight here because Representative Ramel wasn't uh, a voting council member. I will refer to Dirk here to help a little bit. So are we good with eight or we need to keep it seven? I think we need another voting member of the council, is my opinion. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, I think we should add one more, but also just, um, you know, I, I'm honored. It would be happy to, you know, continue. We're almost done, of course, with session. So whoever is going to take over next January when I'm off, know that there's always been a little bit of a lag before we've actually done this process. So session starts and we need somebody to step into that role right in January. So whoever's vice chair, perhaps, or somebody just let's have a succession plan there. Okay. Good observation. Ty? Uh, if you need another member for this, I'm willing to serve. I, I guess I do have the question of just how often these committees meet and is there a specified day? Because my schedule is kind of difficult to, to manage. I don't want to volunteer and not be able to serve, but if I can manage it, I'd be willing to be the next person if you need one. Okay. And this committee meets weekly during session. Uh, next year, of course, will be a 90-day session. So, um, yeah, it's a once-a-week commitment. Um, if that's something you it still fits your schedule. Uh, is it like over a noon at lunch hour, or is there a we be meeting at 10 a.m.? Is that correct? Uh, currently, we are meeting at 9 a.m. On Thursdays. On Thursdays. Yeah. And we, we could change that, but that's just been where we ran it. Yeah. Ty, are you still I, interested? Uh, I think I could probably manage that if you need me. If somebody else would like to do it, that's fine as well. Uh, Tom, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, I think I'm on there now. And I'd be happy to continue too. Uh, I don't have an objection to that. Um, I don't think there's anything that limits the number of people. Uh, we have a little bit too many here. Uh, we can't have more than seven plus a representative for ammo. And currently we have eight. Wow. You can seven. you can remove you can feel free to remove me. I was just trying to step up if needed. Well, okay. and, and I don't know if I can do the I'm gonna jump in because Doyan, because you mentioned my name before and I just looked at the bylaws and the, the committee members, including the legislative committee, has to consist of voting members. So certainly uh, Representative Rammel could participate in them, but uh, in the legislative committee, but not as a formal member under the bylaws. Yeah, and okay. I don't think he should not be, I don't think that he should be, should not be named, you know, like I said, he, he can always, anybody's welcome to participate in these meetings. Uh, we, we get meetings of the, or members of the public that, that listen in on these, so. So we have, we have, again, so Ty, did you, did you say, I, I couldn't hear somebody I said well, oh, I okay. said to feel free to remove me I I was just stepping up if I was needed but my schedule would probably make it hard for me to attend every meeting anyway okay. uh Craig I I think what Todd said is we should really pay attention to that this session starts really hard and we won't have time to rename we should designate a successor on this group out of this group right now so that a minute Todd is not available and, and possibly that's Roger uh, but I think this needs to be one that we don't have time until February to decide who it is we should decide that succession plan right now or later in the year but be, well, certainly before next February typically we we decide this uh, uh commit this in January uh, uh, that's not soon enough each year I mean they start meeting January 2nd this year, right? Yeah, well, so our yeah. person needs to be up to snuff. So it needs to come from this group, but they need to be in the harness the minute the legislature starts meeting. Or at least establish a vice chair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you, then this session is already planned. <clears throat> yeah, that, exactly right. That, yeah. You just said it better than I did. So and if, if, that, if that is... Jay, or that's Roger, I think that's just fine. So one of these folks needs to be the vice chair. Uh, I'm going to volunteer. Love it. Okay. 
Executive Committee, uh, Council Officers, the Chair and the Vice Chair, and Chairs of the Standing Committee. So we don't need a vote on this. I will fill up. It's 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 given. Yep. Uh, the work group. I'm, I'm no longer the. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna fix it. The committee. I, I, I'm I'm gonna fill. I'm I'm gonna fix it. What I'm saying is just it's it's given. It's by default. The no, work. The work group of economic impact is a technical advisory group chairs, and the council chair shall be uh, uh, shall attend the, the the meetings. So th this is given to. Uh, we don't need to go through it. And that was the last. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Wonderful. Um... Do we want to uh, codify this now, or do we want to wait until the March meeting? We have the time to do that. Well, okay. since you went through it, we better hear a vote. Okay, the chair would entertain a motion to uh, accept the chair. Uh, committee chairs. Chair, quick question. Yes. Um, if we go back to the executive committee, if there is a desire by the council that we do have that additional position, since my name's on there twice, um, we also could just formally ask Jay to be the chair of the legislative committee, you know, right now, if, if that if, if that's a desire by the council. So either way, I'm I'm fine. But just if that additional position is desired. OK, so what um, how many we, we've only got what uh, three more meetings? Yeah. Of the Ledge committee for this session. Or maybe uh, you're Jay, not are you willing, are you willing to step into the position now? I think if I'm appointed as chair of the um uh mvpe committee i uh, oh, be yeah. automatically on that correct so oh, we're redundant again yeah okay all right all right yes Not solving any problems sorry um let, let's roll back up to ledge committee for a moment if you could so that we don't have a duplication um or is there somebody else that would like to chair the ledge committee unless jay you're really passionate about this Jay, you have a fine. Maybe we just we're, we're we're okay, and we're just trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend changing mid session. No, that, going that, a fine job. Fine. We we could actually make we could we could formulate the motion so that it takes the chair takes place after the end of session. Um, I'm just trying to. Uh, you know, trying to avoid duplication. Now we've got a duplication on the work group for economic um, because you're chair of two committees. I'm wondering if we shouldn't have a different chair for the legislative committee. If we decide to go that way, I'm willing to volunteer for that. Okay. Um, do we have you on the committee? You got me confused. I'm on a, I'm on a committee, yes. But not a chair. It looks like the two people eligible that wouldn't be duplication would be Matthew, Tom, and, and Chell to chair the legislative committee. Tom, go ahead. I'll do it if nobody else wants it. Okay. Anybody can one way to put it. Tom as, as the incoming chair oh, of the board. So that would make him vice chair now. Well, didn't we have Jay as vice chair? We are switching now to Tom. Yeah, but Jay, yeah. Jay is also Jay chair of the MBE. So when we get down to the work group on economic impact, yeah. he ends up being duplicated. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, now we're cooking with grease. Hey. Oh, it's, okay, hang on. It's tag shares. 
Yeah, we were discussing the uh, executive committee. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there we go. So uh, we'll replace Todd with Jay at the end of session. No, Chell with Jay, Chell and then Todd with uh, Tom. With Tom, thank you. Don't mess this up, Stoyan. Don't, all don't, don't make me write it here. So, all of that will do the next time. You, you sure? You sure you want to do that? Okay. okay. I volunteer, but I made a mistake. <laughs> okay. So the 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 work group on economic impact actually the 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 council chair is the chair of this uh, of this committee. And then all of the tag chairs. And then we'll fill out fill out the the rest of it. Okay. And, and that's that's the last one. Okay, yes, definitely save that document. Okay, I would, uh, if this is clear enough, can we, uh, can I get a motion to accept the tag chairs and the committee chairs as discussed today? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion, Jay? A point of order, are we also appointing the committee membership as discussed? Um, uh, no, a I think committee membership of um, vice chairs is uh, as well in the legislative committee membership. I think if I'm not, if you want to pull the document back up, Stan, I think the legislative committee was is that by default? No. I think what we discussed was both the makeup of the committees and the tags as well so, as appointments of council members to to those committees and and tags. So I, I agree that Jay brought up a good point that we should, the, the motion probably is intended to include everything on the documents we discussed. That's, yeah, that's as, as I understood it. Okay. Do we need to summarize this motion? Or restate it anyways? The motion as I understand it, is we have now filled out the members of the, the council members of the tags and and the standing committees, and uh, we're we're voting to uh, to concur on that. Yes, that's okay. my motion. Wonderful. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item seven. Or uh, oh, so we took care of five and six concurrently. I, now, now I'm following along. Now I understand Jay's question. Um, okay, moving on to item eight on the agenda. Uh, I, I, item seven is the revisions to the 2024 code adoption schedule, mm -hmm. and I I want to move the we code in group two uh, and. Uh, I'm not sure if we need a vote for that, but at, at, at least uh, I want to I want to let you know we're doing this. If you're okay, <laughs> if uh, we 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 call this complicated, we can't keep up with this, especially if the the sand bill uh, uh, is approved. Could could you uh would you recap which codes are in which groups? So group one. Yes. Could you Includes what? Yes, I will show the calendar on the screen. Okay, just give me a second. Okay. Group one, IBC, IEBC, IFC, Currently, we IMC and uh, Inter International Fire uh, Fuel and Gas Co. In Group Two, in uh, the energy codes are in interim uh, schedule. In Group Two, residential code, uh, energy code, residential plumbing code. And you just told me that we need to double check. We that. need to double check if the plumbing code is in Group Two. So uh, we have too many in Group One. We are late with the technical advisory groups and we can't complete the week off. So this is why we want to move it to group two. Our understanding was that the plumbing code was in group two as well, but again, we will double check. Okay. 
Uh, is there a motion to move that, Micah? Um, I, I do want to support that, but I also want to mention that this is um, out of the norm in previous cycles. The council has voted to align with ICC's grouping of the codes. Um, that is a real benefit to those that actively participate in code development because we can align with certain things that are going on at the national level. Um, we can, you know, combine our workloads. In other words, if we're working on something at the national level, but it's important to the state, we're able to do so. One of the big items here is looking at how ICC separates out portions of the building code that are broken up into like general sections and then structural sections. So now we're combining those, and that's how we did it before, had a structural after the fact. So in other words, if you get something into the code, the main body of the code that needs some type of structural um, review, then they have time to do so and propose structural changes to the building code that would align with the code change you already did. So again, this is out of the normal, even though these are the standard ones in the bylaws we have moved in the past to align those with ICC's makeup. Um, I understand that some of the workload for staff may be difficult that way, but again, I just want to make a mention there. I'm not going to make a motion because it's more than likely going to fail anyway. Um, so that's my voice of opinion, but I will make the motion to move WUI code into um, group two. Okay, there's a motion to move WUI code into group two. Is there a second? Second. This is Craig. Um, can I ask, Is um, how out of alignment are we currently with ICC? We are totally out of alignment because ICC changed the uh, the schedule for the 2024 code. So the, the, the codes were grouped in, in different, for example, general, uh, administrative figures, uh, fire. So we, we, we couldn't, I think we discussed that when, when the schedule that you see was approved. Uh, and uh, so it wasn't on this staff uh, uh, performance, it was that we couldn't match the ICC schedule completely. We have some filing issues with it as well. Yeah, and we had some filing issues with it as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Shri Ryder, we have a motion on the table. Kel, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess I generally defer to what staff uh, suggests as far as grouping things, but this would mean that the Residential and WUI tag considers both residential and WUI tag in the same group. And I just have, I want to at least think through that and make sure that I don't know how much work the IRC tag does normally and the WUI tag is expected to do based on potential laws that are passed and, and major reworking of the WUI code. But I just want to be cognizant of that as who is leading the Residential and we go tag and, and does that seem at all reasonable to combine them? Or I, not just combine them, but do the, have them both in group two. Okay. Uh, Roger? Uh, my comment is one more point of order. I think that the motion on the table is up concerning the WUI code. If there's discussion about moving, splitting other codes up, we should do that after we deal with the WUI code. I agree. Go ahead, okay. uh, Micah. Sure. Um, the only reason I brought that up is because WUI code is part of Group A for ICC, so that's why I discussed that point and brought in the other codes. I am the chair for the IRC and WUI code tag. Um, it, it can be done. I don't think that there are major items in the WUI code coming up, especially based on the legislation that's going to pass. I'm sure. Um, my bigger concern would be the IBC for structural um, and all the structural chapters that go along with that uh, compared to the rest of the code. It, it's a big lift, but that's okay. Uh, I'd be more concerned about the IBC tag than the IRC tag. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on moving the WUI code to group two? We have a public comment. Okay, uh, please go ahead. Uh, who do I was. This is Ken Roulette, oh, hi, Seattle Ken. Fire Department. I um, was hoping we'd have the public comment before all of the motions and stuff, but it doesn't appear so. Um, the item number seven on the agenda says revisions to the 2024 code adoption schedule. And I understand it does have a bullet point of 
of talking about we code, but I, I think it's pretty clear that it's staring us right in the face is this schedule. It's already been admitted that it's behind. I've proposed this multiple times now to change the schedule. You're at least 90 days behind right now. You're still accepting applicants for the tag position until February 25th. The next council meeting after that to actually accept them is March 15th. And at the same time on your schedule, it says that you're going to be approving the tag reports. Um, <laughs> I, I I just don't understand why um, it's been just dis disregarded about looking at changing the schedule and pushing these dates back because you're not going to meet these timelines. Thank you. Uh, point, point of order, if I may. Yes. Uh, can I withdraw my request? Uh, I don't necessarily necessarily agree with Ken all the time, but I do agree with him this time. Uh, we are late with the technical advisory groups and I was going to ask you uh, for further changes to the schedule. I'm not ready yet because we haven't uh, established the technical advisory groups yet. So I will uh, be able to uh, provide more details and ask for changes to a schedule uh, at the meeting in, in March. Okay. I assume we got a, a, a hand up from Hoyt. Wait, go ahead. Wait, you're able to talk. Go ahead. Okay, I guess he's not there. Uh, Micah, go ahead. With Stoyan's request, then I would move to withdraw, or I would withdraw my motion and make a motion to table this item until the next SBCC meeting, if that's Stoyan's desire. Yes, and uh, just one thing to add. We already started working. Uh, we're not far ahead, but we started stuff, started working on the courts. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, motion to table is a privileged motion. Is there a second? I will second it. I second his first one. Okay. So there's a motion to table until next meeting, item number seven. Roger. Yeah, I just have a comment. I, well, a comment and a question, and maybe the question comes first. So, Micah, I want to understand everything comes out from ICC at the same time. Um, building code and structure. Is that correct? And your concern is the big lift is to get through it all because it's such a big code? Yeah, ICC breaks it up into multiple sections for the IBC. It's going to be IBCE, which includes the egress provisions of chapters 10 and 11. Then they do a fire safety, which is 7, 8, uh, part of 9, 14, and 26 of the IBC. And then that coordinates with IFC in chapter 9 as well. And then... Um, then in group two would be the admin sections of the building code, IBC general, which is three through six, 12, 13, and 27 through 33. And then IBC structural, which is chapters 15 through 25 and structural so, provisions of the IEBC. So we are, so they do break it up into the areas that, you know, are, are the major areas of code changes and. But when you say, when you say they break it up, are those are those sections available today to get started reviewing? Is staff reviewing those sections, all of those sections? Yes, they are available. Twenty twenty four. Yes, they okay. are available. So then, my comment is, uh, I I agree with Ken. We have to get started. We have to have our tags filled out. Um, I'm supportive of postponing any changes to the schedule or moving groups until officially until March. But, you know, last code cycle, we were scrambling at the end to try to get done. There was a whole lot of work that had to be done. I think that we have to have the same uh, work ethic and diligence at the front end now to get the tag going and get the review started. So um, I don't want to be faced at the end of this code cycle with the same challenge that we had this time. So we need to get started. And I'm I'm supportive of if all of the IBC is available now, we need to get started. And yes, that that 
building code tag has a whole lot of work in front of them because it's a big code, but that tag just needs to get started and get working. So that's my comment. Okay, thank you, Roger. Micah? I don't disagree with you, Roger. It definitely needs to get working. The issue comes when it comes time for proposals. If there are sections that uh, would have impact on structural that have not been addressed by structural folks, in other words, I'm not a structural person, but I know that I would have input on a IBC proposal that may go through. And then later on, the structural folks would see those proposals go through and address the structural items if necessary. Um, and that's what occurs at the IBC or at the, yeah, at the ICC level as well. So uh, I think it's even more important that we maybe separate the structural provisions out from the rest of the IBC, even if we don't align fully with the uh, with ICC's part path, just so we don't miss anything. I know there are some other structural items that won't be ready in time for the March to May deadline for proposals um, that would be later in the year. Based on the new legislation, off-cycle rules will be very difficult to do. So again, there are some important reasons to align with grouping um, at least to some level. Thanks. Roger, do you have any further comments? Well, I just, I, I disagree, Mike. I think we need to get started. And if there are things that, uh, if we've already gone through most of the structural information and uh, there are impacts from other code language, that's something that the tag and the code is going to have to deal with uh, before we do the final approval. So again, I think we just need to get started. I agreed with that statement. We do need to get started. Okay. There is a, a motion on the table, or the motion to table the item number seven till the next meeting. Um, uh, I'm just going to call for a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, let's go ahead and go on to item number eight, and then we'll take a break. So item number eight is the petition to repeal an existing rule, changes to provisions for family home child care, WAC 5151-0202 and WAC 5151-0331. So we have a petition from Dave Cocott representing the Washington State Association of Fire Marshals uh, to reconsider the recent rule that we passed uh, in relation to the family home child care provisions and I believe the main contention is about the exceptions for sprinklers allowed in the new provisions. Okay, uh, Dave, did you want to speak to this? Go ahead, Dave. Thank you. <clears throat> Having been involved in the Billy Code Council in the past, I know there's a specific process for this. Uh, my concern was during the testimony at the last Billy Code Council meeting, the chair of the council opened up the meeting to public comment. Uh, I was allowed to speak. The, the floor was given to me as part of the meeting. During my testimony, I was interrupted with a point of order from Mr. Chappelle. I don't feel that that was an appropriate uh, point of order. Uh, per the, the chair handing over the floor to me, I had the opportunity to be able to speak. Uh, followed the basic rules of Robert's Rules of Order. I think that we should have been allowed to <clears throat> provide our comment to it. The other concerns that I have is that, uh, and, and apparently that, that made some impact because I did notice on the agenda for today that where there is some indication that public testimony could be uh, provided if a council member had uh, requested it. And that's something that in the past when I was chair of the council, I had to be very cognizant as well. But I'm also very concerned that uh, representatives from the fire service and those who were on the tags for the IRC, IFC, did not get, a, were not able to provide their comments to the, the, the basically the, the voting to make the change to add the uh, option to not require fire sprinklers was done. There was really no opportunity for, for comment for that. Uh, and there should have been an opportunity to be able to do that. I think the process was basically, I'm not going to use the word in intending and, and flawed, but I don't think that it was followed exactly properly to be able to make sure things were done. And I remind that the council that uh, that this this is a tag of technical experts, and I've heard it discussion today that we have these tags of technical experts. 
voted uh, in favor of this substantially. There was only one negative vote against this. The council didn't understand that. They were involved in the public testimony. They were involved in the hearings. Yet they made the decision to override the technical experts. I find that as a concern. And I think that uh, there are other people that would like to be able to provide testimony uh, regarding the uh, actions of the council at the last meeting. I'm open for any questions. Okay. Uh, this agenda item is open for uh, members of the council as well. Any attendees that would like to speak to it? Does anybody uh, want to comment on agenda item number eight? Uh, Ken, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm just going to continue on what Dave was talking about with regards to um, the petition that was filed. So again, my name is Ken Brulette, and I'm the Technical Code Development Coordinator for the Seattle Fire Marshal's Office. Uh, I also have a history of being a fire marshal in several jurisdictions in Washington State over my 30-plus year career. And I also provide fire code consulting and instruction courses in Washington State. So with regards to this petition, I'd like to kind of speak about the RCW 34-05- or I'm sorry, dot three three zero, which is um, regarding the, the entire petition for the adoption of amendment or repeal of any rule. And in that section under four parentheses F and H, it states to address in the uh, repeal petition if the quote rule serves the purpose of which it was adopted and whether the rule is clearly and simply stated. Regarding the 4F and whether the rule serves the purpose for which it was adopted, I'd uh, like you to review um, RCW 1927, which you know is the state building code uh, itself. And in the intent finding section of 19.27.031 parentheses three, it states that in accordance with RCW 1927.020, the state building code council shall promote fire and life safety in buildings consistent with accepted standards. And the Building Code Council is not promoting fire and life safety in buildings consistent with accepted standards. Um, no consistency exists with any accepted standard for the proposed rule. And on the contrary, the elimination of an automatic fire sprinkler system causes the proposed rule to conflict with other accepted standards. An example is in NFP 101, the Life Safety Code. Uh, the 2018 edition refers to NFP 5000, which is the, uh, the building construction safety code for daycare homes. For daycare homes that exceed 12 clients, and NFP 5000 states that when a daycare home exceeds 12 clients, that they need to meet the, quote, new daycare occupancy requirements. Automatic fire sprinklers are required in these new daycare occupancies that have clients under 30 months in age, or if the Daycare has clients that are incapable of self-preservation. And in this building code, it states that self-preservation for daycare occupancies is the ability of a client, so the child, to evacuate a daycare occupancy without direct intervention by a staff member. The limiting of 12 clients for uh, daycare or group daycare homes is the national standard without requiring an automatic fire sprinkler system. By proposing this rule and allowing more than 12 clients in a dwelling without an approved automatic fire sprinkler system, the State Building Code Council is not promoting fire and life safety in buildings, and which is consistent with accepted standards. Now, regarding the 34.05.333, parentheses H, and if the quote rule is not clearly and simply stated, the rule is not clearly and simply stated because in option two, it, in the exception, it says the first sentence states that the exception is subject to approval of the code official. The term code official is not defined in the proposed rule. The term also is not defined in WAC 5150, State Building Code, or RCW 1927-015, which is the definitions in the building code. The 2021 International Res Residential Code also does not define the term code official, but it does say, hey, look, for, look into um, if the terms aren't defined, then you use such terms that are described in other parts of the codes. And the, and the building code doesn't define code official. The fire code doesn't define code official. The only code that does is the 2021 International Mechanical Code. Um, and that publication's definition is the officer or other designated authority charged with administration enforcement of this code or duly authorized representative. 
So by having to go to an unrelated code to find a definition that would apply to this rule for option two is obviously, quote, not clear and simply stated. A little history. I began my career way back in the 1980s in California, working for LA County and Ventura County Fire Departments. In California, the Office of State Fire Marshal prescribes the fire safety standards for family daycare homes. In the California Building Code, they have separated family daycare homes into small that care for up to eight children and large family child care homes that care from seven children to the maximum number of 14 children. But since 2011, 13 years ago, all newly built single family residences and duplexes have been required to install an automatic fire sprinkler system that meets NFPA standard 13D. This requirement for the last 13 years has provided a large inventory of fire sprinkler homes available for daycare use, but the maximum number of children allowed is still limited to 14, even with the fire sprinkler system installed. This rule should be repealed because it allows up to 16 children without requiring residential fire sprinklers compared to California that only allows up to 14 children um, without, fire, uh, without fire sprinklers. But you have to remember the new housing stock for the last 13 years have all included residential fire sprinklers in California, while Washington State has not adopted the requirement for fire sprinklers that is base code language in the International Residential Code. This rule also allows children on the second floor and basement without residential sprinklers, while the fire marshal's office in California's rules state that for large family daycare, children are only allowed above or below the first story. If the residential fire sprinkler system is an upgraded version from NFP 13D to 13R, they clearly understand the additional risk of having children above or below the first story. And even though they are already assuming all homes since 2011 have an NFP 13D sprinkler system, they are requiring an upgrade to fire protection by requiring the NFP 13R system. While this rule lessens the fire safety for children in daycare homes, by allowing more than 12 children in non-fire sprinkler homes and allows, allows them to be on levels other than the first floor without the protection of a fire sprinkler system. This truly conflicts with other accepted standards. Based on that this rule is quote, not clear and simply stated and that the rule does not serve the purposes for which it was adopted because the State Building Code Council is not promoting fire and life safety in buildings consistent with accepted standards, then this rule should be repealed. I thank you very much for all of you that volunteer your time and service to the Building Code Council. And also a big thank you to the overworked and short staff that supports you. That includes you, Stoyan. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you, too. Uh, we've got one more attendee I'm going to call on first before I call Mike and Michelle. That's uh, T. Short. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Council members. My name is Todd Short and I am the fire marshal for the city of Redmond. I have participated on the IRC tag for several code cycles going back to 2009. And I was a tag member when this proposal to allow up to 16 kids in a family daycare was discussed. This topic was discussed concurrently with both the IFC and IRC tags. There was a majority consensus of both tags with only one dissenting vote to recommend only the option requiring fire sprinklers for the additional capacity. In my experience serving on tags in the past, I do not recall ever getting such a consensus for such a proposal. The DCYF is trying to create capacity within licensed daycare facilities to accommodate an increasing need that seemed to expand during the COVID pandemic. The TAG heard testimony that the daycare costs can be equivalent to the tuition costs at the UW, which I looked up and is $12,600 per year. I multi multiplied this by four, and that equates to over $50,500 potential additional revenue per year. Fire and life safety in our codes does indeed add costs to building projects, and codes authorize different uses because they meet additional safety requirements. This reconsideration highlighted that the national codes and standards support the installation of fire sprinklers for this increase in number. Allowing the exception essentially says there exists an equivalent method or material to providing residential fire sprinklers, and I don't believe that's true. 
I previously testified that residential fire sprinklers activate automatically and have proven to allow for the safe evacuation of a home. DCYF requires a licensed home daycare to evacuate all early learning staff and children from inside the home to a safe location outside the home in two minutes or less. And they require that DCYF staff verify this every three months. Now I affirm this DCYF policy as studies are showing that evacuation time in a home fire is diminishing due to the flammability of our home contents. In fact, flashover is being realized within two to three minutes and is not a survivable event. Some people think the fire service response will be sufficient, but the best staffed fire departments would consider a five minute response time extraordinary. Add additional time to set up, deploy hose lines, and begin operations, and it's too late to stop flashover. That is why fire sprinklers are required in the National International Residential Code. The two-minute criteria then is affirmed, but I wonder how it's achieved. In a real fire, there is smoke and toxic gases that force occupants to get low and crawl. Kids, statistically, are one of the most vulnerable populations in a fire event. Firefighters are trained to look for scared kids under beds or in closets as they often try to hide from danger. Real fire events can be terrifying and elicit panic in both kids and adults. The two minute window may be achieved when an evacuation drill is known and all the kids are capable of self evacuation. But what about during times where toxic gases incapacitate some of the kids or staff must look for the hiding kids with the two or three staff that are present. And it is much more likely that staff will have to assist each child's safe evacuation in a real event. Fire prevention is in the business of stopping bad things from occurring before they happen. Building and fire codes are adopted to decrease risk and increase safety. I am concerned that this proposal precipitated by an emergency pandemic has created a desire to accommodate an inherent risk that is not necessary. The tags got it right. If you want the additional capacity, then you should increase the safety in the home by requiring fire sprinklers without exception. There is nothing that will provide the early suppression of the fire like residential fire sprinklers, and thus the exceptions for omitting fire sprinklers are not equivalent. The code officials should not be put in the position of having to determine such approval. I am asking the council to listen to the tags and only approve the increase in kids by requiring the residential fire sprinklers without exception. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Todd. Okay, we'll go to the council now. Micah, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My first question before we get into further debate on this would be to ask Derek if he could provide information on the allowances for public comment <clears throat> and it is not um, identified on the council agenda for that specific item. Sure. Um, yeah, the, the public comment, insofar as there are public comment rules, those uh, we look now to the, uh, um, the OPMA, uh, the Open Public Meetings Act which sketches out when public uh, comments uh, are um, to be provided at meetings. Um, generally speaking, public comments can be under the OPMA, public comments can uh, be provided in writing prior to a meeting or, or on agenda items in which action is taken uh, at the meeting. Um, they don't have to be get provided at any specific time. It can be done before a meeting or before action is taken or after the OPMA isn't actually very, um, very clear on that point, but it does uh, provide that uh, public comment should be uh, uh, allowed by uh, uh, a board, uh, the governing board, uh, uh, for when, when actions are taken at a meeting. That's that's what the law requires. As far as how an agency goes about uh, structuring that during a meeting, uh, there's broad discretion uh, for the board chair and for the board itself on, on how it wants to do that. Thanks, dear. If so, I can, Michael, sorry, I want to ask a little bit, sorry to cut you off, I want to clarify, but typically we don't have, we don't allow public uh, comments 
because this is the council work session and the public comments were submitted during the comment period and, and the testimony. So the work session is for the council to discuss the comments and the testimony that are already already received. This is the reason yeah. the, the section and, for the public comments wasn't marked. Yeah, and, and to, actually, uh, I'm glad you said that, Stone, because there is a, a slight nuance here. The discussion that took place at the last meeting was on the filing of a CR 103, or was whether to approve a, a final rule. And the Administrative Procedure Act, uh, actually the OPMA, provides that um, the, the that it's not subject to work that's done on, or under the APA. So I, I didn't say that very clearly, but the the when an agency is performing its duties under the APA, it's not necessarily subject to the OPMA. And this is an example of that, where there is a robust comment period, right, um, for APA actions. And here the council uh, was simply uh, taking action on following all of that robust comments, the comment period rather, of the completion of that comment period. So the, the council has elected, instead of having a whole new opportunity for members of the public to speak to uh, items that have already been subject to notice and comment under the APA, uh, the, the council has elected to uh, simply take a vote, taking into account all of those comments uh, when it's considering a CR 103. Uh, as, an, as an alternative, you could consider taking comments on that, but then we would see what we've seen in the past, which is a, a full day of additional comments uh, on a, a, a final rulemaking proposal. And Stoyan, I think that that's what you were referring to, right? When... Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you both very much for that. That's uh, extremely helpful information, especially based on the concerns for this rule. Uh, again, you all know that I am open to public comments. What my concern was with my item when I requested the point of order for uh, Mr. Cocott when he was speaking was that staff uh, actually indicated that there were comments or people that would like to comment. Um, the fire marshals indicated in their letter that the meeting at approximately four hours and 44 minutes, uh, Chair Doyle, provided public comment, but if you go for a little further back into the meeting at the four hour 43, 35 minute mark of the meeting, it was actually Dustin, SBCC staff that mentioned there were folks that may wanna to speak to this. And then Chair Doyle called on that. So it was just out of the normal. Um, I wasn't gonna say anything, but then when Mr. Cocott started speaking about a minute and a half into his speaking, it seemed like we were getting into public testimony again or public comment. My concern wasn't the public comment. I would love to have this, uh, if we needed to, open this back up for public comment, but I think that that should be noticed appropriately and provide others with the same opportunity to provide those public comments. Uh, again, there was no question asked of, of the of Mr. Cocott to speak. There was just an indication that there were folks who would like to speak to this. I'm sure there were. Um, then, if I'm not mistaken, all three individuals, uh, Mr. Cocott, uh, Mr. Brillette, and all spoke at the public comment hearing in February, uh, or sorry, but, but prior to that, January. Um, they all spoke at that meeting. So they indicated that folks did not have an opportunity to provide public comment. My understanding is they did during the public comment hearing. Um, one of the things that has been noted uh, multiple times through their testimony is that the tag voted a certain way. That is correct. The majority of the members of the tag voted that they felt that sprinklers only were the, the option. However, oftentimes through the co-development process, we will receive a minority report from proposals that did not get through. The BFP committees or other committees may then vote to maybe include those in their recommendations to the SBCC, or you can bring them back up again at the SBC, full SBCC meeting and the full council can vote to move those options forward into public comment. That's what occurred here. Those options were moved forward into public comment, even if the tag's overall recommendation was against them. Um, if we get into the actual proposed language, if we wanna get that far, um, we may not need to, but uh, I would have comment on that. Um, as Ken mentioned a few minutes ago, there was no definition for code official. I'm actually looking at the 2021 IFC that has fire code official as defined. 
the fire chief or other designated authority charged with the administration and enforcement of the code or duly authorized representative. If you look in the IRC and the IBC, building official is defined as identical. In other words, it's that duly um, uh, authorized representative for that jurisdiction to make that call. Um, you indicated or, or it was indicated by their testimony that sprinklers were not required. That is false. If we could please show the proposal or the CR 103 on the screen, the charging language of R331.2.3, which was adopted or, or proposed to be adopted by SBCC, states that an automatic sprinkler system shall be designed and installed. That is the charging language. The exception doesn't, it doesn't automatically get rid of the sprinkler requirement. It allows options. Those options are identical to the I-4 occupancy classification in the building code that would allow many, many more children in a daycare in an unsprinkled building. Um, and that's where those provisions came from. And again, your code official, your fire code official, your building code official does not have to approve those. Again, it's subject to the approval of that individual jurisdiction. I will say it again, sprinklers are required unless the exceptions are allowed by the authorized representative of that jurisdiction. They don't have to be allowed. Um, again, I urge the council to maintain this language. I know that DCYF has also spoke in favor of this current language that allows this exception. Uh, it doesn't mean this exception has to be used, but it does align with an I-4 occupancy out of the building code. Um, if you had an existing R-3 occupancy, which is a more or less a single family residential out of the building code, and they came in and they wanted to make it a daycare or be classified as an I-4 and would be able to allow these exceptions. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why um, it is that major of an issue to allow those in the IRC. Again, we could get into this again if we would like. If the council wants to reconsider this, I think it would be appropriate to open it up for all public comment, including those that are in favor of this language from DCYF and other groups and, and um, have those speak as well and have it properly noticed if that's the case. That was my only concern is the public comment was, or allowing a public comment was not properly noticed on the agenda. And that was my order. It wasn't the actual public comment. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Joe? Yeah, I'm generally agreeing with Micah here. The, the public commenters and uh, petitioners have grievances with the code as approved by this council. They have good points, but we discussed these before and there were lots of points on, on multiple sides. Um, but we approved the amendments, and I don't see anything substantive in the petition that suggests we took the action in error from a procedural point of view. Um, I think the a point of order is not out of order. Um, I think what Micah did was was perfectly adequate and aligned with the intent of the the meeting that we held. Um, I think the other points I could go through them one by one in the petitioner's letter. Um, I think. For example, saying life safety should never be considered to be reduced in order to satisfy the needs of social issues. I think that's what the council does, makes difficult choices between, you know, we could require fire sprinklers in absolutely every building in Washington. We don't. Um, we could um, we could require, you know, every building to be designed for the, the worst possible earthquake we could imagine, and we don't. Um, there's lots of things that we could require that would at some point save lives. Uh, but we need to balance that with with costs and, and other issues. Um, I think it, it, I just looked in the, the residential energy code. The word code official or the term code official is used 26 times. Uh, so if it's not defined and nobody knows what it is. We have lots of problems in every code. Um, yeah, I, I just don't see anything procedurally substantive in the petition that would suggest that we should bring it back open for reconsideration. So I'm going to make a motion to uh, deny the petition. A motion to deny the petition. Is there a second? Second. This is Katie. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay. Aye. So, Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. It is 12.05. Uh, let's go ahead and, and break for lunch and resume the meeting at 1230.
Unless there's any objections. Okay, so ordered. We are waiting for the chair. I assume he had a big lunch. My apologies, I got back a couple of minutes late. Uh, okay. I believe we are moving on to item number nine. Ty, do you have a comment? I just wanted to let you know, uh, sir, that about two or two thirty, I'll be excusing myself from the meeting, heading to the airport. I'm in Texas and very anxious to get home. So, okay, <laughs> well, you're not missing much. We had snow here, Ty. So, can we start with the roll call again? Yes, please. Shell Anderson. Present. Jay Arnold? Here. Todd Byrother? Here. Justin Burkold? Here. Micah Chappelle? I'm here. Damon Doyle? Here. Tom Handy? Here. Roger Har Haringa? Here. Craig Holt? Here. Ty Menser? Here. Ben O'Mara? Here. Hey, Ricky. Here. Katie Jam. Here. Okay. You're all here. Okay. All righty. So uh, in the 2021 WOI code, we have some prohibition or some proposals for amendments to Chapter 3 and Section 602.3. Uh, our Public comment period closed last Friday at 5 p.m. And we have some testimony summaries here. And so we are here today to do a little work session and uh, have some deliberation on these proposed changes. And if I can clarify why today we have only the work session and not a vote for the CR 103, this is because of Senate Bill uh, 6021. So the, there was no reason. 6120, to, right? Oh, okay, sorry, 6120. Yes, I always mess up with the numbers. Uh, so there was no reason to have a vote today and then another vote uh, our next uh, our meeting. The next meeting is scheduled for March 15. Uh, the work session is today and after the session ends on March 7th. So the council will have the time to make a decision. Okay. Is that the eight page summary that's on the website? Is that, um, was this all written testimony? Uh, we have both written testimony and the oral testimony summaries here oh, at the top okay. of that document. Yep. It's all the written testimony that was submitted and click on the names that'll open up the full 
uh, testimony that was submitted. And then at the bottom there, there's a link to the recording of the uh, hearing and their testimony is summarized there as well. Thank you. Uh, over, so we got lots of uh, testimony from folks who are concerned about trees and uh, the current fire science. We have some testimony that calls into um, question the bill that is on the floor right now and whether or not we should be moving on this because of that. And uh, for the most part, uh, everybody's concerned about how to apply the WUI code in their jurisdictions and um, our proposal to remove the provisions of chapter three and go back to the model code is supported by a lot of uh, folks here in the written testimony. We have some testimony from the Department of Fish and Wildlife and I believe L and I, so we got uh, Carol Whitaker with W with the Department of Fish and Wildlife with her testimony. She's recommending a delay. Um, some more, but uh, we've got a lot of folks concerned with what we have going on here. And I think it's uh, time to talk about it. Okay. Um, and it's is it ecology that's in charge of redoing the maps or is, is uh, DNR? DNR, thank you. There you go. Okay, I see several hands up. Let's start with Kachel. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all the public comment, and I guess I'm wondering if even having a work session today where we spend a couple hours going through all the public comments is even a good use of time given that our, the legislature, which is our superior in terms of making decisions on our behalf, uh, is probably likely to act before our, will like act on something, either passing it or not passing it before our next meeting. I guess I'm I'm just wondering about the the usefulness of of discussing all the comments today versus <clears throat> discussing them all at our next meeting where there will be we know there will be an outcome out of the legislature whether it's to do nothing or whether it's to pass a bill that might look like sixty one twenty. Um, um, could I ask a staff and or Derek? Uh, do we need to take action today? Is there some sort of timeline? If, if the action is uh, tabled for March 15th and the bill gets approved, then that's the right meeting to make the decision because the bill will require the council to initiate a no cycle rule and delete whatever it's adopted uh, in the week of. However, if the bill doesn't pass, then the effective date for our courts is March 15, and we have March 15 to do the work session and uh, potentially approve indirect staff to file the CR 103, which will take additional time for filing and preparing some additional documents. So that's the main reason we <laughs> have the work session today. However, it's up to the council if the council wants to deliberate or uh, table to uh, agenda. Okay. Um, and of course, cutoff is the 7th, uh, which is a Thursday. The cutoff, I'll tell you right now, the next cutoff is... Uh, last day of session is the 7th. Yes. So if we had to hold an emergency meeting prior to the 15th, we could do that. Uh, I, I don't we, we, we can do We can do a special meeting, yes. Jay. Uh, thank you, Chair. With regards to Senate Bill 6120, we really can't predict the final outcome of actions by the legislature. I can think of a couple of occasions where bills were moving and expected to pass and ended up dying at the last moment for a variety of reasons. And my preference would be that as the SBCC, we be prepared to control our own destiny and have changes ready to go to solve the issues as best we can, are ready for action in our March meeting. So I think there is some value in this work session and deliberating today. If we were taking action today, I would want to uh, adopt the WUI code amendments with option two in section three. This would provide for local findings of fact beyond a per project basis to address flaws in the maps from the Department of Natural Resources. It provides some exceptions and clarifications for defensible space. It avoids some of the concerns of uh, the things we've heard about impacts to cities um, 
in our urban growth areas while maintaining strong woolly standards that mitigate wildfire risk and spread in the locations where those are um, appropriate. Um, I did listen to the public hearing and, and reviewed the written comments and um, would be, uh, yeah, I'd, I would be ready to take action today if it was something that was allowed on our agenda. Thank you. Okay, Todd. Thank you. I, I also at least support um, doing the workshop today. Um, although I think there's a lot of inside baseball here in context, um, I, I would like to propose that we, we we step back just a little bit and frame this better for anyone tuning in on what we're doing here, how we got here, what council action was taken to initiate this and, and just remind everyone even of the vote, just simple stuff like that. I, I would propose that we need to frame this maybe a little, little more for, for everyone. Thank you, Micah. Uh, I wanna agree with Todd on that. I, I think some context is warranted and, and what is going on, and maybe with some context of the legislation. Um, I know that the legislative committee and, and folks that are involved know what's going on there, but they may not be aware of what that legislation does. So maybe that needs to be included in part of that discussion that Todd mentioned. But we definitely need some background. I don't know if we wanna just jump right into the work session and the proposed changes without that context. And then I do have other comments that I want to once we get past that uh, introduction, thanks. Okay, Joe. Yeah, I, I I agree that um, I think the context is important. Uh, what it says on the agenda is that the council will not act on the final adoption of the proposed amendments to this agenda agenda item. So, in other words, if the legislature does not delay the WUI code, we would have to convene a special meeting before the fifteenth to do a final adoption anyway. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was clear on what the agenda says about what we're, we cannot take final action, I don't think today, because the agenda doesn't allow us to do so. Okay. Uh, staff, do you want to provide the overview that uh, was requested? Yes. So in 2022, the SBCC uh, finalized their adoption of their group two codes, which included the WUI code. Uh, this Adoption included the provisions that we're talking about uh, modifying today. Uh, we delayed the codes a couple times from being July 1st earlier this year to now, or not earlier this year, but earlier last year. Uh, now we are looking at March 15th as our implementation date. And leading up to the implementation, uh, folks who are going to have to do the enforcement started looking at what they got going on and are having difficulties applying the findings of fact sections in chapter three uh, as far as enforcement. So we got a lot of questions about the DNR mapping and confusion there. Uh, we did do an opinion on uh, some of the defensible, or not defensible space, but the WUI interface slash intermixed areas. And we still were getting a lot of questions in on how to apply that in the jurisdictions. And so we, we have that aspect of it is how do we apply this in our jurisdictions as a homeowner? How do I know where I am? How do I plan any of this for the WUI code? Then as time progressed a little bit further, uh, environmentalist uh, speakers started speaking out on the unnecessary removal of trees and destruction of habitat. And many of these folks uh, speak on the multitude of benefits of trees that are um, mature that might be removed by the defensible space provisions of this code. There has been some outcry that the legislative mandate to adopt defensible space is not there. And so we have some provision. Uh, we have some modification for the provisions of defensible space that um, don't remove it completely. And we have uh, some support for that. We have some people that do not want defensible space at all. And so we work with some folks to try to propose some changes. And that's what we have before us in the CR 102. Let me uh, pull up the, this is the kind of plain language version of our proposed rule. Uh, we are here in section three, defensible space gets 
very few modifications, but it, it does allow for more trees in the defensible space and uh, maybe tree islands instead of individual trees um, in the defensible space. So um, a lot of outcries of, I think there's a misunderstanding of this table 603.2 right here. A lot of folks are saying that a 100 foot defensible space is gonna be required in any instance of the application of the UI code. Um, there are provisions in section uh, 501 that if you comply with structure hardening for 501.4 through 501.8, that you only have to comply with the defensible space that is um, located here in 603.2. And so we have the new uh, exceptions in there. And if you are complying through 501 and going trying to use uh, Section 503 for compliance, there's a lot of other work you have to do to get to um, using this table. And we have a lot of questions on how people identify the moderate hazards. Um, we have questions about how many fire weather days a jurisdiction uh, has per annum. And that's a, it's a tough question. And so I get um, answers from jurisdictions that we have uh, talked to that they have either worked with DNR or they have somehow figured out these numbers on their own. And so uh, I know in Spokane, they are saying that they are using these maps and that they are enforcing this code. But there's also support from people who are currently using this that they that more local jurisdictional input and um, leeway to apply it as is needed in their jurisdiction is uh, desired. And so that kind of leads back to the changes in chapter three that uh, really take out a lot of the work that was done in the 2021 cycle. And so um, that's kind of my quick overhead summary of that stuff. And then I'm ready to show the, the, the Senate bill. Uh, I see Todd Barrett is uh, raising his hand. So if you need the, the bill, I, I can show the bill on the screen. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful. But first, I just want to maybe ask for a restatement of how we got into rulemaking. And I think that's relevant because we can say how we got to this point to uh, emergency or off-cycle rulemaking. And then if the legislature takes action, which is their um, obviously you know prerogative, that is another trigger for, for rulemaking. So we can just put those things in, in context, please. Thank you. If if I can summarize, uh, when the WICOT was adopted, the concerns that are discussed right now, the council members weren't aware of these concerns. So the WICOT got adopted. When we get close to the effective date, then some stakeholders raised their concerns. Uh, they missed somehow the uh, code adoption process, so the concerns were raised several months later uh we had a meeting and uh testimony was provided by many stakeholders we received uh written comments as well the council discussed the issues and the council decided to direct staff to start with uh, uh off cycle rulemaking to amend the newly adopted 2021 week if this is if this uh, clarifies. It, it doesn't matter if I follow up chair, um, you know, approximately, I don't remember the vote. Was it a mixed vote? I don't, uh, I don't have the vote right now. Okay, that's fine. Just making sure everyone understands that we, how we went into rulemaking. And then now please, could we talk about if the Senate, if the bill passes legislature, how that could trigger a different um, rulemaking process? Or would it? Would we this still be is, the current? This is the bill 6120. Uh, and I know uh, it was discussed several times at the uh, Ledge Committee, during the Ledge Committee meetings. Uh, and the bill changes the unclear language now in uh, RCW 1927560. Uh, and it specifies that only those sections of the international 
Woodland Urban Interface Code published by the I, by ICC specifically referenced. Uh, uh, so it, it it kind of cuts the council council's authority to adopt the entire code. And I'm sure Micah will, will would like to provide more details. I'm just going very fast through the bill, and then uh, it clarifies that. Under 1927-074, it clarifies that whatever the council is adopting, it shall be uh, consistent with RCW 1927 And again, 560 lists the sections that uh, must be adopted. And also mapping. Uh, most of these comments uh, were submitted for uh, SBCC review and decision, but most of these comments were related to the uh, uh, maps, uh, the, to the map that was developed by DNR. So this bill changes, so it uh, scratches the uh, current map and requires two different hazard and risk maps. And uh, I, will, I will skip everything else, but at, at the bottom in section in section four, I believe it is, the bill directs the Department of Natur Natural Resources to uh, uh, develop the new maps and some additional uh, details that uh, I'll, I'll leave it for the council members. Okay. Great. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, the vote for the WE code to initiate the North Cycle rule was eight to five. Okay. Uh, Greg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of things here. Uh, as I look at the kind of the gymnastics that we're going through to fix this, I, it's very clear that the entire WE code should be withdrawn and started over. Uh, this legislation it, it helps us give this direction on how to do that, and even the options that we accepted that we put together after Justin was so kind to bounce me around and I got lost. I feel like I'm rewiring a rocket ship here. Uh, I think uh, that in respect to what Chell said, we have we can't take action today no matter what. But uh, to me, this 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 we code is so broken that it, I think we need to almost start over and uh, pull it out of the 2021 cycle and fix it in 2024 because it's going to take some time and work. And with that said, that's my observation. I would also like to make a suggestion because of the can size of this can of worms that we provide a time limit, how much time we're going to spend on it today because we could, we could take until midnight tonight uh, to try to understand and fix and discuss this issue. So those... Those are my two points, I, but I do ask for the opportunity to put a time limit on how long we would spend on the particular items so we can end the meeting sometime today. Thank you. Well, you, you are in Olympia, and uh, a lot of things get passed between midnight and 2 a.m. here, so just an observation. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Thanks, and I appreciate everybody's input so far. I, I, I do think that this legislation is probably more important than any action we take on this. However, I think there's some misconception what this legislation will allow. If you read the section, it is section one, item four, if Stoyan wants to go up to that. This will pretty much eliminate the SBCC's authority to adopt anything beyond chapter one, which is specified in this code or in this legislation and the structure hardening provisions, which are shown on the screen through section, the, the, the preceding sections. Um, so I, I'm not sure if folks, I know we've talked about this at the legislative committee, but not everybody's attended those. We talked about having a special meeting possibly on this, but this bill is precedent setting. It will be tying the hands of what the SBCC can adopt as far as codes go. Specifically to the WUI code, yes, but that doesn't mean it couldn't lead further down the road in different legislation that would tie our hands further on other codes. Um, so uh, again, that's a major important factor of this code or the, of this legislation. Uh, overall, I, I, you know, the legislation is going to change what it's going to change. Um, 
I do believe there's a lot of misunderstandings of the WUI code. It is not completely broken. The legislation is broken. The WUI code functions. There are many states that use it. I believe there's 30 plus states in the U.S. that adopt it. Um, and other states or jurisdictions adopt it without the state to adopt it. So it, it works. It's not the code that's broken. It's this legislation. This requires structure hardening. No matter what. So jurisdictions that believe this legislation will allow them to map their way out of something, this is more restrictive. If you read the language on the mapping, it says DNR with assistance from the state fire marshal's office will develop the criteria for mapping. If you wanna modify that mapping as a jurisdiction, it requires you to use the same or similar criteria without flexibility. So once you're in this risk area, the structure hardening will apply without option. The current code we have allows options. I think we've gone through this and many times, I've taught it several times. The changes we made allow options. The changes we made provide for a findings of fact that was not in the original legislation. The modifications proposed, if we wanna go back to those, don't allow for or don't provide information on findings of fact in option one, or excuse me, when it goes to option two that eliminates all the items we've made in chapter three. This legislation may fix something for folks in appearance, but is what it does is it creates a situation where the SBCC doesn't have say and doesn't have authority to amend. It will allow jurisdictions to adopt the code as whole, which they can do now or portions of it. But again, they're not allowed to amend that based on RCW 1927-060, without approval from the State Building Code Council if it affects single family or multifamily residential buildings. That's state law currently. So again, this legislation is not a, the great benefit that has been made out to be currently. The problem was the original legislation and that's all we tried to fix. I did listen to the public comments. Some of it I have to agree was offensive. They indicated that the work group was not made up of subject matter experts, that there wasn't enough of them on the tags, when there was a very broad group of folks involved in this that have a lot of technical expertise. We weren't trying to do something nefarious, get something over on these folks and add more you know, requirements that weren't functional. We were trying to find something that was enforceable. When this bill originally came out and went into effect in, in August of 2021, we reached out to several of these folks, including the Association of Washington Cities that initiated this, to modify that legislation, and they refused to assist. So this is where we landed. Unfortunately, this is where we are today. Um, I think the work group today is important to prepare for what we may or may not have to do based on where this legislation goes. But um, I have more to say on the legislation, it's, or excuse me, not the legislation, the work group items, if we get to that, or if we decide to table this based on the information the legislation. But I want folks to really be aware this is precedent setting and tying the SBCC's hands on what they can and cannot adopt and what they can and cannot amend when it comes to the codes in the state. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Micah, just out of curiosity, the other states that have adopted this, do you know how they go about their, their mapping? Have you got any insight on that? Uh, yeah, they do use a wildland urban interface mapping. They may correlate that with a risk map. Um, FEMA does a risk map. The Department of Agriculture in coordination with the uh, Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, does a wildland urban interface map. Uh, when you look those over, yes, there are large swaths of Washington that will be, if, if something comes together from DNR that's similar to FEMA's wildfire risk mapping, There'll be large areas that won't apply the WUI code any longer, but there'll be other areas that it will apply no matter what without options to get out of the structure hardening. There's no other mitigation path other than what's in this legislation if it passes. Okay. Thanks for the question, Damon. Yeah, and, and I just, just a quick comment. Um, some of the structure hardening prov provisions are, are difficult from a builder perspective. Uh, certainly decks and appendages is off, off the charts. And uh, and I worry I worry greatly in our climate zone about roof ventilation. So, uh, Roger, go ahead. Yeah, I've been um, listening and getting up to speed and trying to understand where we're at and what we could and should do today. 
Um, we've already spent a fair amount of time talking about this bill, which hasn't passed. And we have no idea, number one, we have no idea what will get passed, if anything. We also have zero control over what will get passed. And uh, so for us to spend time today considering what may or may not occur between now and March 7th, I, I don't think that's the best use of our time. I also, um, you know, the these comments, this this concept came up last time or or a year ago when we passed this. Um, I, I agree with Micah. This the the process to adopt what we have today was the same process that we've gone through with everything else. Um, it was voted on. There was public comment. There was plenty of opportunity for the public to comment on it and to participate in the tags. Uh, and I also completely agree with Micah that there is misrepresentation of what this code does and does not require people to do. And um, so my strong suggestion is, is that we do a work session today on the code that we have under the assumption that the legislature does not do anything because we have no control over whether they do or don't. And we should prepare ourselves for a March 15th adoption of the best movie code we can get. Um, and if that takes a special council meeting before the 15th to adopt things that we do today, then we need to do that. But I think that that's what we should be prepared to do today is to get ready to implement the best code we can on March 15th, irrespective of what the uh, legislature does. Todd? Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, so maybe I'll speak to Roger. Um, correct, we, we, we don't have obviously power of the legislature, but we do have the ability to inform and we do have the ability as a, as a body um, to, um, to um, take, you know, take a vote today uh, to um, take a position on it. Now, the Legislative Committee um, does not have the authority under the Council. We we only have the ability to inform and bring back to the Council um, these types of topics, and this is one we are flagging today um, for the Council to discuss and potentially take action if it's the will of the, the body to, um, um, to make a recommendation to the Legislature. So we, we actually do have the ability to, to inform this at a higher level than we are right now. Um, the other thing about you know i think it is it is um important to talk about this this bill um because part of that is is it really a, a challenge to the to the to the the process that has happened i don't agree with some of the the public testimony that this 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 council has intentionally overstepped uh any authority granted by the power of the legislature um this is the process, and the, and then we want the legislature um, to to come back and 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 advise and, and to um, 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 you know tell us if if they if we did not meet their legislative intent. That is their obviously their their prerogative. So I, I think it's really important here that um, as a technical body that we help the legislature understand what is being said here um, and. My concern with this um, is that the state is taking the rulemaking authority um, away from the state building code council. Again, not power, but the rulemaking authority to, you know, to advise our state and giving it to, you know, an ICC process. And as much as important as the ICC process is to everything we do, and it is referenced directly that we shall adopt and amend, this is essentially taking that amend process away in, in many cases. Uh, and that that concerns me greatly, that it's, it's essentially giving up. Now, the, the legislature can always take it back, but to me, that's how this, this reads. And that's what they're saying is to give that authority to someone else. So I'll, I'll um, leave it there. Thank you. Well, if I can respond or ask for Please. clarification is, the executive committee 
potentially asking for the council to give the legislature our opinion on this legislation. Isn't that the next agenda item? Under the uh, update from the legislative committee, is that when that would occur, Todd? Yeah, you, go ahead, Todd. No, go ahead, Chair, because we had discussed this in the legislative committee. So yeah, I'll, you, you said executive committee, but I think you meant legislative committee. Yes. Yes. Um, I don't. Re I don't recall we have it having a, uh, a formal opinion or a formal request. Um, Todd, do you want to? Responded. No, that's, that's that's correct, Chair. What we, what we said again, we said we would raise this this topic. We knew we knew this was already on the agenda, and then we said if it was the will of the council to take action, someone would have to raise that as a motion. And we thought, and it's 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 of course your your prerogative mm -hmm. of of if and where that that could occur in the agenda. So I go back to if I can continue, Chair. Um, yes. Then it seems to me as though this body has two items to address. One is, do we want to do work on the existing code and make it the best we can? And two, do we want to make a comment or, or express an opinion to the legislature? Those would be two separate things. And the second item would occur on the update from the legislative committee. I'm assuming that's the proper agenda item for it to occur. And so I would still rather focus this agenda item on, okay, what's the current code that we have that's going to go into effect in one month from today and is there impact input from people and do we need to make modifications and make that the best um, the best code that we can okay thank you micah great point roger i i agree with you that those are two separate items and i think just a, a preliminary discussion on the legislation was beneficial for our work session and we could move back to the work session and I, you know, when we get to the next item, uh, definitely have a further discussion on this and maybe a motion on a direction we'd like to give, if any. Um, but I would be happy to go back to the work session if that's where the chair wants us to go. And I will have input on that when the time comes. Are you suggesting possibly suspending discussion on item nine, moving to item 10, and then coming back to nine? I, I was not. <laughs> Um, if somebody wants to do that, I, I'm not sure it's necessary, honestly, but uh, if there's, if we can open that for discussion, David, thank you. Okay, Joe? I guess it's entirely possible that if, because I agree that I think the legislature writing a bill like this is not going to help Washingtonians in terms of um, having a good code that they can follow, because our tag said that the if they only use the specific references in 1927-560, that that wouldn't be a complete code. Um, so I think tying our hands is not a not a good choice. I guess if we show some show that that we can handle the handle the code and and get through the public process, that we I mean the the input and response to the input the way that we're supposed to, then maybe the legislature will be less feel that acting is less necessary. Um, so I think this is happening the way it's supposed to, where we're responding to public comments and, and reconsidering something. And I think that's preferable to the legislature acting and then tying our hands on what actually makes a good code um, that needs to be enforced, understood, et cetera. Um, so I, I I agree. I think the work session would be good. And then if we if we do, if we come to any sort of sort of good conclusions out of that work session, then I think passing that on to legislature and saying, well, you know, we think we have a better product um, that works a lot better than the legislation would 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 do. That might be legislature might like to hear that. <clears throat> okay. I too am uh, concerned about this uh, ability being taken away from the council. Um, I think that we're we're more prepared and educated, especially with our technical advisory groups to shape a good code. Um, I'm also concerned with, you know, the testimony received and our proposed fixes, taking the bearing off of uh, uh, defensible space and foisting it on builders to do a you know, war hardening instead. Um, I think there's gotta be a win for both sides. So uh, <clears throat> I would entertain any action if we wanna go ahead and, and go through the, uh, the proposed document. 
from the 17th and discuss that or uh, I'm open for uh, action, Micah. I would like to move on with the current agenda item and discuss the uh, proposed language changes. The what the document on the screen right now? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. You you've got the floor. Okay. Um, first question I'm going to ask is is based on Chapter Three and the proposed changes to it, which would direct a local legislative body to do the mapping. And that was the legal question I believe I posed to Dirk before when this came up is based on the legislation, the original 2018 legislation that says the mapping, statewide mapping shall be done by the DNR or the department. Would this then relinquish or change that legislation? In other words, would this allow the jurisdiction to only apply the mapping that they have done or would they be required to use the statewide mapping in conjunction with this? In other words, do we have the authority to make this change based on the requirements of the original legislation, which is, I believe, substitute Senate Bill 6109? So that was my first legal question, then I have other questions. Eric, you're up. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Micah. Gonna miss you. Um, <laughs> oh, I, oh, I'll be around. <laughs> I just won't be a voting member. <laughs> no, that's great. No, I appreciate the question. Um, yeah, so I don't, look, I don't have a, a response I think that's going to give real clear direction to, to the council. I'll just say this. Of course, the initial bill anticipated there would be DNR mapping, which would establish uh, the um, where the WUI code requirements would, would kick in, right? Everyone understands that. Um, Section 302, which I'm looking at right now, you can see on the screen, provides that the legislative body shall declare the wildland urban interface areas within the jurisdiction. Wildland urban areas shall be based on the findings of fact. Wildland. So uh, I guess my first question would be, what's the legislative body for purposes of this section? Is that defined here? That's the local jurisdiction? I think that's presumed, but I don't know that it's presumed. That is the presumed, and, and maybe I'm not, maybe somebody... Um, maybe uh, Brad from the city of Tumwater who testified and had reached out and did work with AWC could answer that question on their intent going to this language. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Is Brad on, on board here? I'm not seeing him in the attendees list. I'm not either. Is there someone else from that group that may be able to speak to that intent? Uh, Jay, I know you work with them some too. Maybe raise your hand. For that. Go ahead, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I've uh, communicated with uh, the Association of Washington Cities, and I think the intention is that legislative body in this is the um, uh, the local city or county council. So it'd be the uh, the AHJ. Yeah. Well, this, the the statute, the current statute, right? It it um, actually only, and maybe I'm mistaken on this. The statute doesn't explicitly provide that the WUI only is triggered within the statewide mapping. It directs that the DNR shall perform statewide mapping, right? And, and Mike, maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's my understanding about what the current law is. And, and, and in turn, the WUI itself clarifies where the code provisions the new code provision, the WUI code provision supply, where there's a WUI map. Now, maybe maybe I'm wrong about that. If I am wrong, I'm going to defer to people who have been deeper in this issue than me. But is that is that mistaken? I think you're kind of correct in that the mapping is directed by to the DNR or the department, as it's called. Um, but the requirements would not apply until that statewide mapping is complete. And right, right. this. In yeah. that legislation as well, it provides jurisdictions to do findings of fact, but there's no process for that. Well, here, so, so here's how do you do the map? Yeah. That, that's the question is how would the jurisdictions do the map and are they allowed to do the map and only have it apply based off of the legislation that requires the statewide mapping to be done by DNR? Yeah, so all I can say is what 
the, the original bill, which was adopted, of course, is RC, now codified at RCW 1927-560, provides that upon the completion of statewide mapping of the wildland urban interface area, um, the certain provisions, statutory provisions uh, of the code are adopted. And then, you know, the SBCC went ahead and amended that to include additional requirements. That's all it says. So the actual, um, the actual work as to what is required by local, I mean, sorry, where the WUI applies, which maps it apply to, is done within the WUI. So this is going to your question, Micah, is does this conflict with the statute? All the statute says is that DNR shall conduct mapping for the WUI, and then in turn, the new provisions apply. Okay, that's reasonable. I, I have no issue with that. Okay. I, I think uh, that is important. No comment on policy or not. That's just what the that's what the statute sure. says. So I no. believe that, that does give some wiggle room within the WUI, you know, for local jurisdictions to establish s mapping. Uh, but like anything else that we work in, if there's uncertainty, then there can be continued uh, a risk of continued conflict on the issue. Absolutely. I think that some of the new legislation is beneficial in that it does specify or, or provide more clear language on the mapping, who does the mapping, and if you do your own mapping as a jurisdiction, what criteria you have to follow and how, which the current legislation does not. So again, I'm not completely opposed to the new legislation, which we'll get to, but um, there are some things in there we have concerns with. So speaking to that, um, I, I've, when this came about by AWC and the proponents, including Brad, I, I reached out to them twice and didn't hear back. Um, I even included uh, Councilmember Jarenold on that. I did hear from Jay, so I appreciate your time you took to, to talk with me and, and talk about some changes. I reached out to those proponents to this change to ask where we could find things that would work. What are they using or wanting to use for findings of fact based on this change? If we go to the model code, it says the jurisdiction can do this based on findings of fact. I wanted to ask what their standardized process was for this. The reason being is because I know jurisdictions and, and designers and others like consistency. So if we're going to have a, a findings of fact process, maybe that would be consistent throughout the state, since that's what we're looking at here is state code language. Um, this model code doesn't really make that determination. The changes, the original changes we made to, to Chapter 3, which is included in, in Option uh, 1, in those changes provides that guidance. This is the same guidance that the Department of Natural Resources used in developing the wildland urban interface map currently. So it'll be, it was providing consistent findings of fact pathway or process for jurisdictions to use throughout the state. I think that's our, our goal as the state is to, to adopt something the entire state can use, not just provide generalized provisions for individual jurisdictions to provide a mishmash or, or a patchwork of how this would function. So that was the benefit of, of option one. Um, and that's really the biggest part of option one is it's the findings of fact, it's the mapping process or the allowance of a mapping process for the individual jurisdiction, what is, which is not clear in option two proposed by this change. So um, I do want to um, look at maintaining option one, which is maintaining the current amended language of chapter three which provides guidance, since there is zero guidance in what is provided there. There was public comment that said in our guidance, it talks about Appendix E as an optional path. That is an optional path. It's not required. It's an option. And all that, there's no real technical code language in Appendix E. It's just a guide. So folks are going, we didn't adopt Appendix E. There was no reason to adopt necessary Appendix E. It's just a guide. It provides information. It's almost like a form letter with fill in the blank sections. Um, so again, this allowed for multiple options. One is the guide from Appendix E or the guide from Chapter 3. The new option they're proposing has no guidance. So I'm going to vote against option two when it comes time. Okay. Pete? Yeah, I spent a considerable amount of time going through California's process and uh it was not incredibly clear how they came to this th this model but 
in essence, any municipal district can essentially claim their city uh, as a as not part of that code. So they're they're separate entities, and the WUI code applies to everywhere where nobody actually makes a claim to it. So the city of Pasco can say, we will do our own mapping. And then as it turns out, if you go to those cities and you try to figure out what that mapping is, it's not clear that they have mapping. And so, you know, I, the, the California model isn't necessarily a good one, but I think what they have tried to do is move that decision-making process not from a project by project level as it would currently be under option one, but to the cities to make a broader decision on what their entire entity would be governed by. Um, that seems to be, you know, one of the address one of the major problems that I had with the mapping in general way back when is that when I looked at it and, you know, compared it to my individual surroundings, it didn't make a lot of sense uh, and that there were huge swaths of of our region here, which, uh, you know, clearly were not, shouldn't be in the intermix area, but were in the intermix area. So the mapping was inadequate. How we get to a point where the map is better, I think is best left up to the individual entities, the cities, in deciding whether they want to be in the WUI code as it's written in, as in option one, or make the option to, to go to their own own system, which is essentially option two as I read it. Uh, so I just want to kind of let you know what I found from, the, from, from California. Again, their system isn't exactly terribly clear uh, from, from that standpoint, but I think it does give more freedom to the individual uh, municipal districts to make their own decisions. Uh, and I think that's what option two does here in the, uh, to the best capability. And I, I think I will be a supportive of, of option two. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Jay? Yeah, I concur with uh, Pete on supporting option two. Here's a couple of things that, that, that we've heard through uh, the process. Number one, that in many areas, the maps are flawed. Um, they don't make sense. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Thurston County, where the proponent here, Bad ben, Brad Medrud, who's the planning director for Thurston County, was had several examples of things like car dealerships uh, being uh, uh, applying uh, to the code. Um, and even in my jurisdiction, there's some places, given the uh, 1.5 mile proximity category and the guidance that Mike has mentioned is pulling in areas that just do not make sense for the hardening of uh, structures and the defensible space that is required. So what option two provides is the ability for local jurisdictions to do findings of fact, not on a project by project basis, which is what Appendix E is about, but for their jurisdiction. And in some jurisdictions, we've heard the maps are fine and they're going to adopt the state map as is. For many others, they will want to tweak it. And so option two gives the local jurisdictions that, that particular power to say, here's where uh, the real risk areas are on the ground where the WUI code needs to apply. Okay. Uh, Micah? I'm back to defending a code that is not my code. I've <laughs> just worked at it a whole lot. Um, I do not disagree with Pete and Jay. Our, the jurisdiction I work for does not disagree. The maps are flawed. So many people dis uh, agree that the maps are flawed. My question to them is in option three, how does that provide a path for jurisdictions to fix it? It does not. There's no guidance for doing a findings of fact. Zero. The current chapter three provides that option. When Pete mentioned California, um, I'm just going to go off of what Cal Fire does. They're responsible for what they call state responsibility areas. What they take into account for their mapping is fuel loading, slope, fire weather, and other relevant factors, winds, other stuff like that. 
that are the major causes of wildfire spread. That's what occurs in chapter three as currently amended. It provides that guidance on using those factors to do your findings of fact and mapping. I, I don't disagree that the map is flawed. I do disagree that it that you're saying it doesn't allow a jurisdiction to provide mapping or modify mapping. That's exactly what the legislation does currently. It says jurisdiction shall do or can do findings of fact and instructs DNR to assist with that findings of fact. All chapter three is doing, it's not taking away the allowance of the legislation for jurisdictions to do mapping. The current chapter three amendments are providing guidance on how to do that. So there is no you know, discrepancies or DNR coming back and going, we don't agree with your mapping or you know, something, some major natural disaster happening and folks coming back and saying, hey, you didn't use standardized criteria to develop your mapping in your jurisdiction. When I reached out to Brad, I did ask, or is there something in this current chapter three language we could modify to allow jurisdictions as a whole to do that mapping and not go on a partial by partial basis? In other words, if, if Stoyan would scroll up to or whoever's controlling the screen, it would be, uh, oh my gosh, I have it open on my screen. I've got too many screens open. One moment and I'll tell you where. Um, Section 302.3.1, that has the language for areas to be evaluated. What I heard Jay say, and, and what, is, what is the concern from AWC, is the area to be evaluated. I reached out and said, hey, is there something we can modify in here to make this work better for you? Again, the only person that responded to anything was Jay. <laughs> so... I, I, it's, you know, that's a whole saying, you, know, you hear the codes all the time, and maybe Todd will laugh at this one is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater type deal. Um, we've got good information in chapter three currently. Maybe we need some additional modifications, but to throw that chapter out entirely, I think is throwing away a lot of work from a lot of experts that will provide the guidance for findings of fact that's allowed for the jurisdiction to do by the legislation. Thanks. Pete, your hand's still up from last time, or? Okay. Uh, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, I guess for Micah, if section 302.3.1 was salvaged, would option two otherwise be serviceable in your opinion? I, I would say no, because there's so many other criteria that fall under what DNR has done for the current mapping, um, we're gonna in, in kind of throw that, just, just to say, I'm gonna say no, we'll keep it short, and there's a lot of discussion here, but I would say no because there's so many other important parts of chapter three. If you just pulled that section out and moved it into the other item, it still wouldn't provide any guidance on findings of fact that is standardized for our state. Okay, thanks. I guess I'm, I think there's a couple things that are necessary to to make the week go better, and one is allowing flexibility and hardening in first defensible space, and I think that's part of the proposal. But we also the mapping is not something that we can handle, and and it is not maybe what we would have wanted or or would would want, and we have no control over that um, in the short term. So I guess that's like even if we were to suggest that we have code language modifications and they're great and and they're universally loved by everybody we still can't control the mapping which is also a a challenge um so i i guess i i see let's keep working on this and get to code language we like but we still depend on mapping no matter what the code language is thank you joe jay uh First, to to Micah's question of, you know, how would you make option one um, uh, work? The, the feedback that I have heard is that the issue really is that you've got a formula here that's talking about vegetation density and proximity and uh, the, the structures. And the vegetation density doesn't take into account what the vegetation is. So you're pulling in a lot of urban areas, and that's some of the flaws in the map. And the same with the proximity ca category. So I, I don't think that there is a 
simple change that can happen there. And because of that, I think we're, we're saying, let the individual local jurisdictions decide. And so with that, I'd like to um, move that we, um, as the Building Code Council, only move option two forward. Jay has made a motion to move option two forward. Is there a second? Well, I'm, I'm going to jump in for a second because I just want to be clear about what this agenda item. I thought this was a work session on the uh, the options, and if any action is going to be taken, I think it would need to be noted in, as an agenda item. Okay. Can we excuse me, Mr. Chair? Go ahead, uh, Derek. Can we provide direction for 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 staff to uh, perhaps craft a final proposal to bring back for final action at a subsequent meeting? That's that's my particular okay. intention here. Understood. When you said move forward, I thought you were talking about uh, moving forward with a CR 103 filing. Okay. Let me um, restate my motion, if I may, Mr. Chair. Please. Okay. I'd like to um, direct staff to bring um, forward for consideration at a subsequent uh, meeting or special meeting the Wooly Code amendments that include uh, option two. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? All second. Thank you, Pete seconds. <clears throat> Discussion on the motion, Micah? Again, I, I don't believe that the modifications provide guidance. It just changes the code language. You still have to do findings of fact. There's zero guidance. Um, and we're getting rid of all those other items. Jay mentioned vegetation. That's discussed in other sections of the code that we've adopted. You will identify what that vegetation is based on the vegetation modeling, which is allowed for or get provided for in chapter um, nine of the current amendments. So again, I think we need to vote against this find some common ground in chapter three to make some modifications instead of throwing the entire chapter out and starting from scratch. Thanks, I'm gonna vote against it. I urge others to vote against the motion as well. Thank you, Micah. Todd? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I do have concerns on that. I, you know, and, and Jay, I, you know, you made a comment about, you know, essentially, this should not apply to urban areas, but I mean, and I know that's not exactly what you meant, but but this is a wildland urban interface. This is addressing our urban environments. And I think a lot of our, our disconnect is actually in those high areas of threat. And, and it concerns me greatly when we don't have statewide provisions that give guidance, you know, having an agency like DNR um, be able to, you know, you know, guide local jurisdictions on a methodology um, so I, I also would 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 vote vote against this because everything can be improved, but we have a structure in place and 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 maps that can be improved. And I also get concerned when we don't have, um, you know, DNR. And, I, I, and again, I know what's in the, the 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 bill that's in you know in the legislature right now that it does reinforce the DNR component but they have a forest management plan that we also have to start to align. And one of our biggest challenges um, at local levels is, is aligning our, our development code and our life safety codes. And, and, and we need to keep trying to bring these together and reinforcing that rather than, um, than throwing, throwing out um, some, of, some of that statewide consideration. So I'll be voting against this. Thank you. Roger. Yeah, I I was uh, wanting to speak before Jay uh, did the uh, proposed the proposal. Um, you know, Chell had asked, well, Mike, is there any way we can take option two and and modify it that you would be okay with? And and he said no. And I was prior to that thinking of asking Jay, is there anything we can do to option one to make it acceptable? And I just from a five thousand foot level. It's here's the mapping that you use, unless the local jurisdiction chooses to do their own mapping. And we can give them some guidance, whether it's an appendix or a reference to an appendix or something. But 
make it clear that across the state, we're adopting the WUI and we are giving the local jurisdictions the ability to do their own finding of fact and do their own mapping. And I think Micah may say it already says that, but obviously not clear enough. So um, is there anything we can do to option one that would make it clear to jurisdictions that if you go through a finding of fact that includes items A, B, and C, and D, that you can, you can do that. Um, so I'm gonna vote against option two um, the proposal on, on the table. Okay. Uh, Mikey, did you want to briefly respond to that? Yeah, I do want to say, Roger, it is in there. When we look at section 301.1 under the scope of that chapter, storing what's a scroll up, we actually have it in here in the code that says the design, sec, second sentence of that, it says the designations are permitted to be modified upon approval of the findings of fact in accordance with section 302. So it already gives the jurisdictions or anyone the authority to do or modify the designations of their jurisdiction by doing the findings of fact, which is exactly what option two is saying. It's just there's no guidance. So but, the rest of chapter three provides that guidance. And if we need to modify the area to be evaluated to satisfy those folks, I think that'd be the best way. But it does say it in there, in my opinion. Well, I'm on agreements with you, though, that there there is ways to modify the language. And I'm totally open to that. That's that's my point, Micah, is obvi it obvious. It is not clear to a number of people and people that are looking at it are saying, well, how do we do it? And so if we can strengthen that sentence and give them some direction, would that be a better solution? So uh, that's absolutely. It would. We'll, we'll move on. Thanks, Roger. Pete. Yeah, I. Uh, I agree with Micah that section one, option one has better wording for, for a lot of this, but option two is where the focus on their freedom of the local jurisdiction is to make that decision. I know that, you know, if I were the city of Pasco and I looked at this and I would want to redesignate an area 10 miles by 10 miles, uh, not 40 acres. And so it's a question of the breadth of application from my perspective in looking at the DNR map. Uh, and my easiest solution is to just give it to the cities and let them make up their minds. How you provide technical guidance for them to make up their minds is, I, I'm not sure that has to be in the code or not, uh, but, pro but probably sections of option one should be put in option two to give them guidance to do that. But it, they need to be able to do that on a much broader area than the 40 acres that I think option one focuses on. And maybe that's not applicable. Maybe maybe uh, uh, Micah can address that. Maybe you can do larger areas in big chunks. But uh, I, I really still much like the option two's version of let the cities decide what they want to do with their individual uh, regions. And as far as I can tell, that's more or less what California does. And if you go into those regions, you don't get much information. It's not clear how the individual cities made that decision. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, Jay? A couple of points to um, Roger's question of, um, you know, what's, what's my opinion of option one? That's where I was saying that because option one uh, has broad categories about vegetation density and distance and the, the issue that Pete just brought up around the size of um, uh, proximity that you have to worry about. That's where I, I think there's not a simple fix for, for option one. To Micah's point that you the jurisdictions can do a finding of fact on the, the code, we heard loud and clear when we kicked off this process in November, the jurisdictions can only do that on a per project basis. Someone puts in a permit application, they could be a, have a finding of fact and say it doesn't apply. But then you have to do that same thing for every other permit application. What we're looking for is a way for the jurisdictions to do this for their own uh, areas. Finally, to the question of guidance. Today, there is no guidance. Uh, 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 before the, the uh, effective date of this WUBI code, jurisdictions are making these decisions themselves already. And we're just asking to continue that, um, uh, pushing the responsibility down to the local government. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. 
Yeah. Um, just here's a really dumb question, but um, option one is option one, option two, and then there's chapter six, and chapter six is part of both option one and option two. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, cool. I just wanted to understand the motion more clearly. Thanks. I, I'm sorry. I, I I didn't realize that the defensible space was part of this discussion already as far as option two. We've had this question before, and I think it was answered at the public com was in public comment here. It was somewhere else on this document that said option two and option one and option two are part of something, and then the separate defensible space is a separate discussion item. That is correct. Okay, thanks. Jay, does that coincide with your motion? I'm fine with separating it out and have a separate discussion on defensible space. Sure. Uh, Ty, go ahead. Uh, that basically covered my issue because I wanted to know how the defensible space was, as we're talking about modifying option one, I wanted to make sure that we were going to address the um, in changes in defensible space, but it sounds like we'll deal with that separately. So I'll I'll just be quiet. Okay, Micah. Appreciate the robust discussion. I do believe there are changes that can be made to 302.31 to address those concerns. Um, and, and I'm not sure, Jay, where it came up that this could only occur when an application is made. Um, I don't believe that was ever my understanding of this and, and that a jurisdiction, if they want to do something with the mapping, they can do that because the mapping is specified in legislation that allows findings of fact and has irrelevant or separate from this code. However, this code does provide guidance on how to do that findings of fact that the legislation does not. So maybe those could be used in conjunction. But again, uh, it's not my understanding that this can only be done by a jurisdiction when an application is done by parcel or by individual project. Um, and, and as such, like I said, I would be happy to, to work with folks to, again, I reached out multiple times to work with those folks on, on things like the area to be evaluated, to allow an entire jurisdiction to do an evaluation. And maybe it just comes from modifying some language in there that for the, you know, in, in 302.31, that more or less says the, the the jurisdiction can determine the area to be evaluated, or if they don't, they can use the 40 acres based on this information. Again, I think some simple modifications to the work that was already done by these subject matter experts would be very beneficial. Um, I understand folks are struggling to use this. There, there are folks, including me, that will struggle to use this. Again, our hands are tied by what this does in the legislation. The code overall, if we even adopted the model code, is not necessarily flawed, but when you tie it in with the legislation and the structure hardening in the legislation, it is difficult. So we're just trying to work with the best we can to make something that's balanced and enforceable. And if we need to modify that, that's what we're doing along this process. And it's unfortunate that it's now in legislation to maybe do this for us instead of letting us work through this process. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Pete, I think your hands up previously, uh, Roger then Shell, and if we can kind of try to get toward the end of discussion here. I appreciate it. Roger? Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to respond to two things that, that Jay brought up. Number one, the cities are currently, uh, you indicated the cities are currently doing it. And I think what some cities are doing it, not all cities. And I think what I actually understand that what the purpose of the original legislation was, is we want to have a statewide buoy code so that it's only, it isn't only selected communities that are um, that are doing the structural hardening um, or doing the you know doing using a buoy code and um, i and then i also the question about why cities can't do it on their own um, you know do it for their whole municipality do their own mapping for uh, thurston county if they want to do a whole thurston county it seems to me as though we could modify 302.3.1 to basically allow Thurston County to do a countywide mapping, and that would that would um, eliminate one of their major concerns with the current code. Okay, Shell. I guess I heard from Jay that uh, findings of fact could only be done on a per project basis under Option One, and I heard from Micah that. That's not true that one could do a map based on option one 
for an entire jurisdiction. And I guess I'd, I'd like to know which, why there's a discrepancy based on the code language in there. I'd like to hear from Jay and Micah about what, why they might disagree. If, if I could possibly try to attempt to offer an explanation, I think that we're talking about two different things. We're talking about a project approval and we're talking about taking the base DNR map and making modification to it on a county or a municipality level. So maybe taking some areas out of WUI, maybe even adding some areas to WUI. <clears throat> but each project would still need to be evaluated, evaluated upon permits. Does anybody disagree with that, Todd? No, I don't. And I, I want to remind everyone we did have testimony oh. from Dave Cocott on what the city of Spokane is doing. So if someone is knowledgeable or if someone could advise us on that again, that might be helpful. I do want to clarify something you just said, Damon. A findings of fact is not required. It is not required unless there is no designation on the current DNR mapping. So if you've got, if you've got a, I think it's a dark green area on the current mapping, it's, it's designated as vegetated, non-inhabited. In other words, there's no structures. So once you put a structure there, you have to make a determination. Well, somebody has to make a determination, whether that's the jurisdiction or DNR, if that's the route you want to go, to determine if that's an interface or intermix and whether or not the movie code will apply. But a findings of fact is not required, except for that instance. And that is stated in 303.1. Okay. Um, on the original map, it was called a wildland, so it's now vegetated and inhabited, but that is where that comes from. But a, a designation, um, again, or excuse me, a findings of fact is not required by this code, except in that one instance. Okay. All right, we have a motion on the table to adopt option two of chapter three. Uh, if you do a roll call vote, please. Um, no. There's out of order. I don't think that's the motion. Pardon? Point of order, I don't think that's the motion. We're not adopting anything today. You're right. right. Adopting was the incorrect language. Jay, could you restate your motion? Yeah, that we're directing staff to uh, bring back uh, for final action at a future meeting Wood Code Amendments with option two. <clears throat> All right. There's the motion. Uh, let me do a roll call vote, please. Michelle Anderson? No. Jay Arnold? Yes. Todd Byrother? No. Justin Bogart? Nay. Jay. Micah Chappelle? No. Tom um, Handy? No. Roger Herringa? No. Craig Holt? No. Hi, Mincer. Yes. Ben O'Mara? No. Pete Ricky? Yes. Katie Sheehan? No. Nine to three against? Okay. Uh, any further uh, discussion on the public testimony to the movie chapter three and six? Micah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to jump to chapter six in the defensible space section and have a, another robust discussion on that. I apologize, folks, I have made for trying to get through this quicker. Um, when this came about at the meetings, I, I did put forth a, three of those exceptions to the defensible space. And the fourth one came from the Association of Washington Cities. I think Jay included that in his um, amendment or proposed amendment. I do want to um, discuss some written testimony, and, and I think I mentioned it in a previous meeting, is that I would like to strike, when we look at this, I agree with those, of course, exceptions one through three. Exception one provides, um, I think what folks would have talked about would provide an alignment with what they perceived the intent of the legislation was, which did not include the defensible space right out of the gate. 
Uh, section two and three provides some specific direction on existing buildings and structures and additions and alterations. And then exception four, um, I have no issue with that exception, aside from the fact that it is specific only to areas where that are urban growth areas. Can I go back to the document, please? So I'm going to bring up your the testimony from Wabo so you can show the changes. You're I don't. About. I didn't ask for that. I I don't need to see yeah, that. I appreciate you trying to be proactive, Dustin, but I don't need it. <laughs> um, so so with that, um, in exception four, we believe that the jury, that the code official should have that authority to exempt buildings or structures with the conforming water supply. But we would like that to apply to any jurisdiction that has a code official. So we would like to strike, or I would like to strike the. Um, first part of the sentence where it says within urban growth areas designated under RCW 3670A110 and just say the jurisdiction's code official shall have the authority to do so. So again, I, I don't think we should limit that exception to just those specified areas. If you have a code official that can designate or determine you have a conforming water supply, they should be able to allow that exemption no matter what. That's my modification to 603.2, or recommended modification, if folks want to mull on that for a few minutes. And then if we could also scroll down to um, the next set of modifications. I agree with the table. This, this clarifies the title. Um, and I agree with section 603.2.2. I think this would alleviate a lot of individuals' concerns about cutting down too many trees. Um, the biggest concern there was, was trees next to trees and, and cutting them down. I do believe that the crowns of trees or other things should be should remain. Um, and so does that uh, written public testimony or, or other written te public testimony. And then we want to recommend that we strike the word mature from ground cover in 603.2.3 there. Um, that's a subjective term. What's a mature tree? There are many very small trees that are mature and then there's larger trees that are mature. And I think the intent there is just to remove that dead wood and litter from any tree to a height of six foot. If you've got dead wood litter, you're going to remove it. Um, if it's a live section of that tree less than six feet, I don't think it will be an issue. But again, this is specific to dead wood and litter. And I don't think mature is necessarily um, <clears throat> indicated or defined. and would be subjective to the code official or the inspector. That'd be my recommended changes. Again, we're not totally opposed to this um, as code officials. Thanks. <clears throat> Roger, go ahead. Uh, I just am in support of the changes as proposed, as well as Michael's Micah's uh, last few comments. Okay. Um, since staff is bringing back a new document, can you uh, make note of these changes to bring back uh, the next meeting? Yes. <clears throat> Point of order, Mr. Chair. So, right. are you going to have a vote on this? Because we don't we don't have the language. I was going to ask Mike if he can send us whatever he's proposing, so we can sh at least show this on the screen. Because so, Dustin was right on, and I just said stay on the other document. Dustin, if you would like to pull up Wabo's um, written proposal, it is in there showing the strike through on the appropriate section of um, exception four and in the other section 603.2. So he was on the right track being proactive, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely he was. Yeah, that's what I said. He was on the right track. I just wanted to stand there the other document first. <laughs> so if you want to, if you want to make that bigger, um, I appreciate it. Yeah. Let's see here. No, he, Dustin was doing great. I just wasn't ready to go there yet. <laughs> so I'm struggling here. Let me open up this in a different spot. I think you were on the right track when you hit the view if you go to single page. Nope, I guess I was wrong. <laughs> Uh, I don't get to use this program very much anymore. <laughs> Here, I'm just going to open up the original testimony I got from Bobo. Give me one moment.
Yeah, Bluebeam opens your thing in a new tab and Bluebeam mm -hmm. shows split screen. It's not always that fun. Oh. There we go. And it's not in any color or anything, but you see it with strike out and underline. Okay. Yeah, so what you see there in the middle of the page is going to be that strike through on that would be exception four in 603.2. Uh, where it strikes the, of course, the urban growth area designation and just says the code official may exempt those buildings or structures. And then again, you're doing a strike through on the word mature in 603.2.3. And that's what you need to see uh, Stoyan for the change. Thank you, Dustin, and thank you, everyone. You're welcome. And if folks want to discuss that further, it'd be great. Jay? Uh, thank you. And thank you, uh, Micah, for this Wabo proposal. The two things we're trying to fix in the WUI code, one was uh, local um, fixes to the broken maps. And second is when you're looking at defensible space, the impacts of that in uh, in cities, basically. And so the original proposal uh define urban growth areas, which is uh, something we use in growth management as far as defining those. But uh, I take uh, Micah's point is a good one that the local code official could do this and op open this uh, wide. Our original proposal from AWC on um, putting urban growth areas was one to, to limit the impact, but uh, would be supportive of Micah's changes, proposed changes here. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion on public comments? Jill? I guess. I I, I think we're good in chapter six or, or we're we're getting close to good. I think the option one versus option two is still out there. And I would love it if we convene if we end up convening a special meeting in March. If uh there was some more thought uh, to how to modify option one to make it more amenable to those who don't like option one and those who don't like option two to figure out ways to amend option two to make it more amenable like option one so that we're not just a page match on uh, March 7th or March 8th or whatever we would have that special meeting. Yeah. Uh, any further discussion on this topic? Okay, uh, moving on in the agenda. Uh, number 10, Legislative Committee Report. I have a question about, uh, <clears throat> we didn't give any vote on the Micah's proposal. Uh, we could, uh, I would certainly entertain a motion. I guess I don't know what the motion would be. Um, yeah. To, to direct staff to uh, make the changes for the next meeting. I In that case, I'd be, I'd be happy to make that motion to make the changes as suggested by Wabo or Micah in uh, chapter six. Prepare those for our next meeting. I'll second that. Thank you. Motion and a second, any discussion? If I can speak to the second and yep. um, Chell, I do want to, I believe that the red lines that were proposed that were sent out have are also additions. Is that, isn't that correct? Yes, yes. anything yeah. in red is, if it's underlined, it's added in, if it's struck through, it's removing. So I would ask Chell actually as your amendment is your proposal to include yes. all of the red shown and Micah's wobble? Yes, with the further amendments, yes. The the red areas shown in these in the chapter six here, uh, along with okay. Micah slash Wabo's uh, amendments to those amendments. That's what I was seconding. Okay. Uh, seeing no hands raised, uh, all in favor? All right. Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, item number 10. All right, thank you. Uh, so the Legislative Committee, of course, uh, meets weekly. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Stoyne, if you're willing to discuss the few bills that are still high priority and um, have made the, the session cut off. And, and then we can revisit whether or not um, the, the, the committee um, you know, has raised any of these to the attention of the council for potential action. So it's best to start with Stoyne. Thank you. So I, uh, you see on the screen the cutoff uh, calendar, and we passed the last day to consider bills in House of Origin, and the next cutoff date is uh, on February twenty first. And as it was discussed before, this is the last day uh, of the regular session. I think uh, it's important to have this uh, calendar and then after the third cutoff these are the bills with uh, high uh, priority so 1899 wasn't high priority however uh, some uh, changes were added that are somehow uh, affecting uh, uh, related to a council business so i have i have the bills with high priority here I can go through each one as they are in, in the table, or if there is a preference, I can open the uh, particular bill and, and the council members can can discuss it. So, and I, I'm happy to um, kind of lead a discussion here if, if, um, if everyone feels that's valuable um, to kind of characterize the discussion in the, in the committee and then uh, any individual council member, please, please raise concern. 1899, um, wildfire reconstruction, that, um, specifically this is dealing with um, um, tragedy, you know, wildfire, um, especially related to recent fires on the, on the east side in, in uh, Liberty Lake near Spokane. Um, the reason this came back to high was, um, you know, a lot of the discussion in this, I, th I think one thing, you know, as we took comment, um, there's you know discussion about whether or not relaxing uh, codes when you're in a when you're in disaster recovery is the direct right uh, the correct approach. I would say all stakeholders, and I've been part of a delegation from the Spokane area that in Olympia. Say everyone in the room, uh, intent is for um, relief and assistance. Uh, the question here is kind of a technical one for the council of of how do you go about that? Is it through relaxing codes? So in this case, perhaps energy codes, uh, uh, and, the, and the issue is when there's a loss and insurance will not cover um, any any additional costs related to changing you know building codes in this case. Um, this is also the case so with ecology, with infrastructure. So all of that is in context, but obviously our our purview is specifically on on um, on these energy code related provisions here. So is that a good setup? And is anyone have questions on on this or or Katie or others that have kind of raised this concern on the council? Uh no, Todd, I think you did a good job of summarizing that. And you know, one of the things that we talked about in the legislative committee yesterday was just, you know, especially with this language that we're looking at. Um, which I think is the vague section is actually down in number three of the section three. Um, just how, uh, oh no, I'm so sorry. Sorry guys. Um, you're right. That's the one, um, you know, just understanding that this is a bit precedent setting when we're thinking about changing our code um for a disaster is this is this the way to go so i i appreciate the way you set that up thanks i think it's worth noting as well that this is limited to a very short time frame is, is there is there a time frame at the bottom no it, I mean, this is this is the schedule i was talking about within, within the bill very last within the bill yeah. go, go back to the language <laughs> Um, just down, yeah, these are buildings that go up, oh, oh, you passed it, go back up. 
Is that, oh, sorry. I'm well, wrong. there's an expiration date, but above that, yeah. keep, uh, you keep going. Uh, there you go. These are buildings that were that were damaged between July 1st, 2023 and September 1st. So this is not affecting even a percentage of the percentage of buildings in the state. Chair, do you want me to call on, on people or do you want to? Go ahead, go ahead, Todd. Okay. Well, I see why I took his hand up. Well, no, this answered my question is, is that, you know, what what's it tied to a declaration of what? But if it is specific to basically what happened in Spokane, which it appears is that, that's, that's fine. You answered my question. Okay. I, I think the specific question here, we can scroll, I believe, up is, um, to ask the legislature for a little clarity of, of what the intent here is. It reads as if, if a propane, um, you know, Damon, maybe you can help me, I'm going to chair the, the, the supplemental, the secondary heating source, um, that, that, that that's already allowed. What our question here is on a rebuild, uh, whether the other aspects of, of, of that table, if it's a bundled solution, um, do not apply. So you're essentially saying you don't have to meet the other credits if you were to go that fossil fuel pathway, is that? Well, I, I mean, the way I would read it, I mean, if I were building over there and helping somebody re reconstruct, I would try to take the most uh, uh, beneficial pathway. Just, you know, maybe assume that I have a heat pump without supplemental. And yet, even though I do have propane as a secondary heating source. So yeah, I, you could fudge the, co the, the code a little bit but again, I don't think we're talking about that many structures. Joe, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think so. There's five system types that get you starting amount of base credits in the residential energy code. If you use the um, R406 prescriptive path, there's a system type two where you have a backup fossil fuel or electric resistance heat source, and a system type four where you have no backup. So system type two gets you one and a half credits right off the bat. And system type four gets you three credits. So if I read this legislation, essentially you could put in the backup heat source like a system type two worth one and a half credits. But in fact, the authority having jurisdiction would possibly consider you a system type four that doesn't have backup. So essentially you'd get three credits instead of one and a half that's that's how I see a literal reading of this bill. It's slightly vague, but that's how I would interpret it. Yeah, me as well. Okay. So I, I think if that covers that bill, I think the question to the council on any of these is 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 there any you know will um, to seek an opinion by from the council? Uh, this is our opportunity. Otherwise, the um, the legislative committee simply um, maintains its uh, its authority to inform. Or, if there are any questions in, uh, for the legislature for for clarification, that's also appropriate. Okay. Okay. Hearing none, we can move on to the next bill. Then, please. Twenty seventy one um, is refers to, uh, you know, kind of harmonizing building codes with, you know, the, 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 you know, bills that passed last year related to, to zoning codes. So 27.1 has a, has a bundle of different um, provisions in it. Um, as it relates to the building code, there's um, specifically, uh, the most important is the first section uh, to us is, is it's, it's requesting the state building code council form a technical advisory group and and to explore moving middle housing types specifically six plexes and under if I have it correct uh, into the residential code. Um, so I, I think that has been the, the primary one of the primary um, discussion points uh, with the committee. I'll just kind of briefly summarize the rest of the bill and come back to this. Is uh, the other there are passive house provisions in here uh, that would would be relevant but tend to to be more considerations related to zoning and development codes, not necessarily the uh, uh, the energy codes, unless I'm missing something. So section one is the one that's primarily the, should be the purview of the state building code council because it is an, it is an ask. And a lot of the discussion has been um, 
is this enough flexibility for the state building code council to be successful for the state if it's very specific um, shall be the residential code knowing that um, it will still point to many of the other uh, the other codes um, so go ahead roger is there a uh, deadline for us to come back with something well i, I this is moving quickly in effect uh, maybe stoyan can point to where it is november 2026 is, is there a deadline for us that we have to have a, a oh. risk back to them by in the next code cycle or it's November, so the sponsor, uh, sorry, I'm still messing up when you were asking me for deadlines. Uh, the date is November 1st, 2026, so it aligns with the training of code option cycle. Okay. Uh, my only, you know, I continue to harp on getting going so that we can try to meet the next code cycle. So if this is adding another tag that we got to form and go through, and it sounds like it would be complicated, um, it's just more work we would have to get done by that date. He talks about a technical advisory group. It doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't specify if we need to, if we can use the current technical advisory group that will be uh, working on the residential code. Uh, this bill is kind of cross over the residential and the building code, so that that's an additional discussion that. And I, I I can't quite read it. It isn't big enough on my screen. It's the we need to the tag would need to make recommendations by November. Uh, recommendations to the SBCC. Is that how I read that? No, the potential adoption must happen by November first, twenty twenty six. Okay. That's all I've got, Todd. Thank you. Go ahead, Micah. I just have a question on interpretation. Maybe it comes from Dirk or Storian on this. For the tag, does that mean the tag is going to accept proposals for these changes, or does the tag have to come up with the changes and make the recommendations based on public input is kind of the question, or are we just going to go through the normal tag process? In my opinion, it, it looks like it's similar to the uh, mandate that the council had for the EVs. So we didn't we didn't get any proposal and the staff put the proposal together just to start the conversation. So I don't, that's the typical council procedure. We start with technical advisory groups. If there is something that they can discuss, they will start with this proposal. Uh, the technical advisor group also can uh, craft a proposal for a future discussion. So I know I'm not inter interpreting anything, but it's unclear to me how the process will start. Well, hopefully we can guide that process. I know there's a lot of folks that want to be involved in this and not just as a voting tag, tag member. Um, if you all remember, we have gotten a proposal like this uh, from a group as part of a code change. So, you know, I'm sure those folks would like to be involved and not just have to be a tag member. So um, I know there'll probably be public meetings, but I, I definitely want to keep this open as our standard process to accept proposals. And if we have to go through a formal process to do so, I would encourage that even if I'm not a council member. Thanks. Micah, I, uh, I was expecting Wabo and your group will propose something because you said you were working on something. So I was trying to be lazy and not, not put together anything. We, we are working on something. We have a separate work group that is putting something together. So yes, we've been anticipating this for quite a while. So we've been working on it for almost a year now. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Micah. Roger and Ben. Okay, Ben. All right. Roger, are you gonna okay, were you gonna speak? I'm done. Sorry. Okay, okay Ben. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Um, I guess looking at the language, is there is there a definition anywhere where they define what multiplex um housing is? And if it's meant to be like a, a multifamily mid-rise, or is there some definition that aligns with the building code definition of um multifamily housing? as some of it may fall under the commercial code. Yeah, go ahead. 
I was going to say it doesn't align. <laughs> it is a new definition in the language, and it talks about up to six units, and it has uh, specifics on what those unit types would be. Okay. Yeah, there, there was a lot of care last year on the zoning bills to um, to add definitions and get them aligned, and then this, you're correct in, in your observation that this seems to break from that, but it, it I also read it as up to six. Um, what I'll say on that on that first paragraph is if you go back up to the first section, oh, there you go. Okay, there is a definition. There, so I take that back. Six dwelling units on a single structure. So uh, yes, I mean we we all know on this on this council where those different thresholds are. Above two, it goes to the building code. Above four, we start to have appraiser discussions, and you know so forth and so forth. So. Yes, there, there's the technical side that we're discussing here. If you scroll back up to the first section, though, I think the the bigger question I have for the for the um, for the council is, um, I I have questions on the data that that supports this. That's you know, um, in section one in in the statement that the legislature finds, and and if they find this, they, they you know that's that's their prerogative. But that this. Um, you know, finds that builders and residential focus are more familiar with the provisions of the residential code and then allowing them to be built in there, you know, will result in housing being easier to build and more affordable without sacrificing quality and safety. That's the key, the key question right there is does this, if that's true, does this give the building code council enough flexibility to, to find the, um, the best pathway to achieve that? I can find data um, that supports otherwise on performance-based codes and so forth, but I'm not an elected official, so... Uh, just technical question to the council on on how to inform this. And if not, go ahead. Oh, Charlie, I didn't see your hand. Oh yeah, I just raised it. Um, yeah, I guess my my only concern here is that it presumes that the answer will be found in the residential code, and it may or may not. The tag may or may not elect that option. It could be a modification of the IBC instead of, it might be easier to be a modification of the IBC than it would be a modification of the IRC. And this kind of, my biggest concern is that this forces the hand that it is within the IRC and not within the IBC. Thank you. Micah? Yeah, Chell makes some good points that, that that and that's covered under section two that the council may not be aware of is this seeks to exempt these structures from the building code and only provides guidance to the tag that they must consider life safety systems and accessibility, um, which would allow for for something way less than what we get now. Um, and I don't know if any of the fire marshals are still on and want to speak to this. I know they had some opinions against that as well where they wanted to have a, a directive language in here that they must bring over these life safety systems and, and accessibility. And for folks that may not uh, work in the codes or be active users in them, accessibility is applies to these units in the building code when you hit that number three unit. So the three through six um, would not be in the one and two family. So you'd have to apply accessibility and provide accessible dwelling units, whether it's a type A or a type B to a certain percentage. And again, this only says we must consider that. So there's definitely gonna be a lot of discussions and, and this tag is gonna be very important, but the council should be aware of all those things in here. And I don't have an answer to your concern, Todd. I, I, I think that the overall legislative findings and reasoning in here and what they're seeking is not data-driven um, as you indicate. And so uh, I think this is going to be a tough one. I think it can be done, folks. I, I think I've spoken to this before, and even in the legislative committee and last cycle when this bill was presented is that this is a, a fabulous idea. However, again, it's legislation tying the hands of the subject matter experts and those with technical knowledge on how to make this happen. Um, we weren't opposed to this last time. It came through the tag as a proposal originally, we just wanted modifications on how to do it and make it happen. And unfortunately, the proponents didn't want to work with that. Um, they just wanted to exempt these or put them in the residential code. So I don't believe this is the best path forward, but I think it can be done and that the legislation is important for that reason. So we'll work with it. 
we'll figure it out. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And I will say that um, this did go to Senate House, Housing yesterday. I believe it was yesterday in testimony, and and the fire officials did come out in that in that uh, meeting. So that that testimony is available in, in their concerns for this this section. Um, although I don't want to speak for them, testimony is available. Okay. Anything else, Roger? Yeah. Go ahead. Todd, I just, you know, as we've done this, there's been a few uh, comments. I think it was down on item four where the definition doesn't match up with what the, def you know, last code cycle we were trying to make definitions work. Now they're going away from it. So if there's any opportunity for us to give feedback at this stage of the game to get the wording, like the definition of multiplex housing to align with what work was done last code cycle, that I would really support and, and um, you know, I think is important that that kind of input can be helpful from the state building code council to make sure that as much as possible, the, the legislature, uh, the, the bills that are passed, um, do conform fairly well to the language of the current code. So just a general comment about the last couple that, the, that we've talked about. Thank you, Roger. I think, I think that is an important point and I think that's an easy one under a current authority to, to inform. So uh, good point. We do have a hand raised in our attendees. I'll leave it to the chair to acknowledge. Is this agenda item? It is. Okay. Uh, Dave, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I'm involved from the State Fire Marshal Association with the uh, legislative items. In 2071, we've tried to work with the proponent a number of times to get the language from may to will they did change it from may to will consider uh, that was not acceptable to us as well we're, we're unfortunate at the point that we have put out a call to all the fire marshals to get with the local legislators and to get this bill uh killed it's it's just it's going to be a real problem for us we uh we understand where it was going but with, if it's not going to be sprinkled it shouldn't happen so that's what our, our position is at this point, what we provided testimony for. Okay, thank you, Dave. Okay, anything else on this bill? Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, 56, 57, these are the uh, kid homes. Go ahead, Stoyan, because I'm not I'm not very familiar on this. So it was introduced last year. It died at some time, and then it was reintroduced this year. So we we missed it at the beginning for a little bit, but we, we cut it. So initially, uh, it was exempting. Uh, this section, section three, kit homes under 800 square feet. So this language is the same as uh, the last year and uh, original bill and it's substitute. The language is the same. So it, it exempts uh, kit homes under 800 square feet uh, from compliance with the building code. So we are going back and forth with Mike. He believes that this exemption includes the building permit, uh, which is kind of unclear, but what was changed was the kit homes. So initially, the language, the definition for kit homes allowed structures uh, that were built somewhere and who knows under with what kind of standards to be assembled on a job site without compliance with the building codes. Uh, and for the substitute, excuse me, for the substitute, the definition was changed to read as shown on the screen. So A, item A for A, it refers to the HUD preemptive standards, but it's really unclear, is it for manufactured homes or something else? And the second one, it refers to the Department of Labor and Industries and their inspections, which is great, but at the same time, Department of Labor and Industries will do the inspections following the Washington codes or whatever they adopt for these factory built structures, factory assembled structures. And 
Section 3 exempts this kit home. So it is better compared to the original uh, uh, version, but it's still unclear uh, how it will work. Chair, you don't need to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to. Hi. Um, I'm reading this as they meet the HUD code and LNI is the department that inspects it, which is not any different than any other manufactured structure in the state. And that the 800 square foot exemption is simply to the building code 1927, not to these codes and inspections. So, um, so Chair, on that question, and I'm not an expert in manufactured homes, but does it meet the HUD code if it's if it doesn't meet the other spec, you know, the requirements of chassis and so forth? I, that's that's where I get confused with how how they can apply that code to something else. Yeah, I I wasted a bunch of years looking at converting shipping containers into housing units, and had many discussions with the. Uh, the gentleman at LNI that oversaw all manufactured structures in the state. It was super informative, and I kind of wish we could have brought that to fruition. But um, it, it doesn't need to have a chassis. It doesn't need to have tires. Um, you know, I, I see where a kid home would fall into this category. So it just simply means it's essentially an unassembled manufactured home. On a chassis and wheels. No, it doesn't have to have a chassis and wheels. And that's but, that's where I get confused with whether or not that's that's not the intent of the HUD code, yeah. No, so I mean, this is not necessarily a tiny home. Um, yeah. So that, that's that's my interpretation. Micah, please enlighten us. Oh, I don't have any enlightenment on that at all, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually, I, I agree with you, Todd, on that. I, it's not clear on on where this would apply, whether or not it, it applies to the to L and I as a factory assembled structure, because um, it's not necessarily factory assembled. It's it's the walls may be built, but uh, it's assembled on on site. So I don't know on that, and I'm not sure how that will play out in the long run. I do want to kind of question the thought to, or the the interpretation from Damon that RCWs don't apply. RCW 1927 wouldn't apply to this. If you scroll down, starting just a little bit um, to the last section there, and this doesn't reference... Um, anything other than they're exempt from permitting based on this chapter or section, I guess, um, chapter subject permitting. And in this chapter, item number six, it says residential building permits. I, I don't know. I read it a little different than others. I imagine, I think that's what Stoyan mentioned or alluded to. But again, this bill will exempt kit homes under 800 square feet from permits is how I read that. Doesn't that say subject to permitting right there? I don't know. That's the importance of an Oxford comma, and it's not very helpful in legislative <laughs> language. <laughs> that's a whole other code debate, right, guys? Yeah. Well, Mark, that is a, as a question for sure. Thank you. Okay, Roger. I don't want to go down too big a rabbit hole here, in it, but it kind of a I think applies to the the <laughs> next item, and that is the the chassis discussion that that Damon and Todd had. I mean, we've done we have done wood box and steel box modular buildings that are up to nine levels of boxes in different cities. The L and I inspects the boxes themselves. They are not on a chassis; they are transported. Um, the whole assembly has to meet the building code. So my, I, and I'm curious, this kit home definition is not clear to me either, but I guess I'd ask for a clarity on what the comment about the chassis was. Well, maybe I can help Roger. I was, I was at HUD last week for, for a workshop in DC and, and there was some discussion, uh, um, you know, in, 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 in the, uh, U.S., um, House of Representatives, I think there's a current bill being considered that would remove the chassis. And there's a lot of concern and questions about whether that is essentially trying to take the HUD code um, into what we consider modular construction that does meet the IBC or IRC you know, or whatever it may be. So it's actually in the ICC codes. So is that trying to preempt it? And, and we know the complications of 
different trade associates and everything that that would that that would trigger. So I think this kind of falls at a mini, at a mini level in, in that same category of what is the intent here? Is it trying to utilize the HUD code to bypass the building codes? And and I don't know. So the <laughs> chassis is the big question of once you remove that chassis, is it still HUD code or do you trigger the building codes? Yeah, I want to be careful about overstating my knowledge of how the, the codes actually work at the factory. I just know from a definitional standpoint, uh, under the HUD code, the HUD standards and LNI's definition of a manufactured home, it, it does include a chassis. So I'm I'm reading the bill, uh, the substitute bill report, and it's it's quite lengthy. It gets way more into detail. Um, here it says kit homes are defined as structures designed and constructed in a factory to sufficient life, health, and safety standards, as outlined by HUD, to be used as housing for at least ten years, and to be assembled on site with or without a permanent foundation. So this is this is the engrossed bill report. Um, Kid homes must be inspected at the factory by LNI for in-state factories or the functional equivalent is what we've seen here. So they're at least envisioning these things to be put on foundations or potentially. So the chassis really isn't a, a mandatory thing. But they're inspected at the at the factory, but then they're put together on, on site. So nobody yeah. inspects them, they're actually put together. As I read it, that would be correct. Well, the, the text that Damon, Damon is reading, it, it was the in the original bill, so it was replaced by this definition, as far as uh, I can remember. <laughs> it, because in the original bill, it says, you know, shall be built somewhere in the factory following standards, but it didn't clarify what kind of standards. And I, I, I remember last year, we so that LNI is inspecting this, uh, uh, you know, concealed uh, like a wall or a plumbing core or whatever it is. But LNI said, no, 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 we don't inspect those. We inspect the entire unit. So in this case, something that is developed in a different country can be delivered to the site and assembled without any idea how this enclosed uh, part or sealed part was was uh, constructed. So taking this into account, the bill was modified, and this is how it reads, right? So it, it refers to standards, but and requires LNI to inspect it, but it's unclear what kind of structure is that. Okay, yeah. Go ahead, Shell. Yeah, I guess I, I don't understand how it's constructed both in a factory and on site. That just seems um, it's probably constructed in one one place and not the other. Um, and I I guess I have lots of questions, but um, I, I don't know. Like, okay, when you look at the last part of the bill, it says new sections added to 19.27. And it seems like some numbers are missing from there. Like it would be 19.27 dot something or other. Um, Because right, the section referenced above 1927.015 is definitions. So how can it be exempt from definitions? That just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so there's some numbers missing, I think, from 19.27 uh, in section three, where at the bottom, because where it says 19.27.015, that's the definitions bit and then down below it says a new section is added to chapter 19.27 but like that's right. they don't number the section until after the legislation is passed if okay. there's other bills that come up with other new sections then they okay they number those sections yeah because yeah. yeah. i was trying to find because this is basically an exception for something i was trying to find out what it's an exception to because the the section it's in would tell me what it's exempt because it, unless it says, I guess it's exempt from this whole chapter, meaning 19.27 is exempt no, from everything in 19.27. I don't understand what it's exempt from. Yeah, to be clear, what it, it would do is, so it's a, Chris is right. The, the way that this works is the code, the code revisor gets to figure out where the number is. And the, you know, Senator Wilson and others aren't going to guess as to what those numbers are when they're, when they're drafting the bill. 
uh, the, the effect of Section 3 would be to exempt those small kit homes from all of the building code requirements under 1927. And that would include um, the building code or the residential code, any fire code, any all way of codes. Um, 19.27a is actually where the energy code is, so it presumably right. wouldn't exempt it from 19.27a, right? Because that's not specified. Uh, that would be my tentative view, uh, but again, people might disagree with that. But this speaks solely to 1927. 27A is not identified in 27. Yeah, I, I guess just it, it just seems, I don't know, it, it really, really against the purpose of having codes in a state to exempt a structure from absolutely every code that exists in the state. That just seems, um, we already have manufactured homes, which which would presumably fall under that category, as will be discussed later today. but. 800 square feet you can get a decent two bedroom in that um decent sized two bedroom in that so that's a lot of homes uh potentially under that thing it just seems like a really uh, i don't know really against the idea of having codes at all if you're just going to exempt everything under 800 square feet from that so, just, like just, just a quick reminder that we're down to an hour and 25 minutes and we still have uh some items on the agenda we can get to Sure. Um, I, I agree with Chael on this. I, I in others, it just I think it adds more questions than answers. Um, in exempting a certain structure from permits or requirements, uh, if you talk to L and I, if if someone builds a structure this size on a chassis on site, it's not required or not going to be moved. L and I will tell you that's not their jurisdiction. So it's only a chassis and a factory bought to a site that's their jurisdiction. So it, it's, this just, you know, who, who at that point would be permitting the foundation if the permitting is not required. I, I really think this is not clean language um, with that. I, I suppose this is the appropriate place to supply a, or provide a motion where the SBCC would be opposed to this legislation. And that would be my motion if that's appropriate. Motion All second. Or second. All second. All right. Discussion. Hearing none. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Um, so heeding the chair's recommendation here, the obviously the WUCO we've talked a lot about. Um, Chair, I'll, I'm going to now defer to you and, and let, you, let you guide this because. Uh... Okay, uh, we did obviously dis discuss this in depth. Uh, we've got pending legislation. I think the most beneficial part of the legislation is, is the map updating. Um, without this passing, the maps stay as they are. So uh, does this body want to take a position or send a message to the legislature? Micah? Yeah, I'll speak up since I was the one that uh, <laughs> brought this up earlier, definitely on the topic that this would tie the hands of the State Building Code Council to not provide amendments to the WUI code. I, I Even if, if folks feel that's appropriate for this code, that to me would lead down a slippery slope that would uh, maybe allow the SBCC to have their hands tied in the future for making amendments to the codes. Um, and, and I don't want to see that occur. I think that's a bad precedent. I also believe that the SBCC should oppose this bill based on that fact, but also the fact that they continue to provide code language and legislation. There are no other codes that we have where the legislators have put in code language that has to be followed. They direct the SBCC to develop that or amend it through rulemaking process, which is robust. Um, again, I think if uh, we do find some language that we could provide to this bill or some direction that the SBCC would support would be that we do not want to lose our authority and we would like the code language removed from the bill. I fully support the mapping changes and modifications there that gives DNR more authority to provide create a risk and hazard map or the two maps risk and a hazard map and the criteria that goes along with those and we'll provide that 
you know, findings of fact process or, or how to do the process for jurisdictions beyond what we've adopted if it if that gets moved forward or, or removed our, our current 2021 language. But again, I would definitely look to this council to oppose removing of our author authority and support removal of the code language from this bill. But then we could provide support to the mapping change language. So thanks. Okay, that sounded, that sounded, that that sounded really point. close to a motion without being one. I, you know, I I don't want to cut folks off, but that would be my motion. Uh, oppose the uh, the removal of authority and the um, inclusion of code language, further inclusion of code language. But again, I wanted to have folks provide that opportunity for discussion. I think there's an allowance for public discussion too if folks are on for that. So okay. thank you. Uh, Jay. I uh, appreciate the uh, concerns Micah has here. I think given the momentum on this bill and kind of the assumption in our previous discussion that this bill is going to pass, that um, we need to come to the table with some uh, specific changes. And the biggest concern that I've heard Micah articulate is the one that said local jurisdictions can adopt uh, sections of the international, uh, the ICC WUI code, but they can't modify it. And I'm wondering what is the change that we can put on the table that would allow that. And I think if we, I think we should be prepared to to do that versus just a blanket opposition to the bill, which um, uh, could get steamrolled. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Joe. I guess I'm I'm with with Micah on on that one where I think we should. I guess I think it's it's clear to me that the bill needs a substantial change. Um, in terms of what it tells us, we we can and can't do uh, as the building code council. So I would support opposing the bill insofar as it has those sections in it. And I think that's probably the clearest way to get the attention of legislators that there is uh, a flaw in the bill. Um, and there are two ways for us to voice our concern. We can simply write a written opposition to the bill, or we could direct staff or maybe our legislative chair to actually go testify on the bill. Um, so there's actions that can be taken here. The hearing is on the 20th, which again, I think is next Wednesday. Can we do both? And we could do both, yes. So is there a motion to that effect? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the next item on the legislative agenda. Oh, Chell, did you change your mind? I'll make a motion. I was trying to think of what was actually said we could or should do, but um, I'll make a motion that we make it clear to the legislature, the sponsor of the bill, um, through a letter and through testifying that we oppose the bill for a, for a couple of specific reasons. And if those reasons are removed, then we would not oppose the bill. And those reasons include um, the removal of authority to modify the code at the building code council level. Okay. Um... That uh, is best directed at this point to the chair of the House Committee on Local Government. Um, so are, we, are you directing staff to write a letter in opposition? I guess I don't know the best way for staff to communicate that. Um, I think if if this is an ongoing process, the quicker the, the better. And if a letter would take a week, then... Um, Communicating other means might be preferable, which is why I left it open ended. <clears throat> is it possible if the council uh, it for well, picks a council member, the council chair, or you know Michael or whoever to testify, or you want staff to do that? I guess I'm open to whatever is most expedient and what is preferable. Um, if it's council chair or or staff, I, I guess the motion is not specific as to that. Um, and I don't know, I defer to the council chair. Do you 
Uh, I am unavailable on Wednesday to, to attend that meeting. You are available? Sorry? You are available at that time? I am, I am unavailable. It would unavailable. be the 20th. On the 20th. Tuesday. Uh, if, if I could jump in, one suggestion I would have is, and certainly defer to Todd on this, is the, perhaps the legislative committee can determine the best, most successful way, persuasive way to get the information to it rather than kind of trying to anticipate that now. Yeah. The legislative committee does not meet until next Thursday, which. Um, that's a problem. Right? Well, we, no, we, we can, we can call a, a meeting anytime. I guess I'd, but it, I'd, I'd rather if we oppose the bill, get the communication in ideally, you know, today or Monday that the council opposes the bill for this very specific reason, um, but doesn't oppose the rest of it and leaving it up to, you know, whether it's a letter from the chair today or Monday, I I, I guess I don't know. I defer to, to staff on what's, or others on the most expedient way to do that, but the legislative committee does not meet in time to provide that. Understood. So, uh, you know, having, being here in Olympia and having testified on multiple pieces of legislation over the last 25 years, uh, first of all, anybody anybody on this council can sign up to testify, and you can do it remotely. You don't have to be there in person. Um, but I think what we're look, what I'm getting the sense that we're looking for, is a, an action by the council saying the council has voted to oppose this legislation and recommends that it does not pass. Yes, because we can show up and testify, but and we can identify ourselves as a council member, but we cannot say we speak for the council when we do so. Um, this would be identifying that we speak for the council when when testifying, and that that I'm leaving it up to, I guess maybe the legislative committee chair or the chair of the council to to do that or designate someone to do that on behalf of the council. Okay, so so again, and then Mike, I'm about to call on you. I'm asking for a motion to do something. Mike, Mike, Mike is raising his hand. Mike? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> I'm thinking. Mike, we lost you if you're still talking. Uh, Micah, are you there? Uh, Katie, go ahead and see if Micah pops back in. So, I, guess, I made a motion. Was there a second on the motion? Just could, you, could you restate the motion, please? Yep. The motion was to have the council oppose the uh, bill uh, that we're looking at right now um, due to a specific reason of it prescribing what the council can and can't do re with regards to modification of the code um, and to uh, take action in two ways. One would be to communicate the most expedient format to the sponsors of the bill, this opposition. And the second is to find a designated representative, which could be the council chair, the legislative council chair, or other people chosen by those to testify on behalf of the council that we oppose the bill for this specific reason. I'll second that. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. Anybody want to speak to the motion? I've said my piece. Okay, Mike, let's see if you're. Let's see if I can stay connected for two minutes. I go. agree with Tell that uh, we should support in speaking in opposition to portions of this bill, but not all of it. The mapping import the mapping part is important. So thanks. And if you need my help on that, I'll be available. Okay. Chell, would you ex ex that that's a little bit of a change from your motion. You spoke to the whole bill. Are we only speaking to portions of it? Yeah. yeah. That was part of the motion was we are only opposing the portion of the bill that restricts the council's ability to modify the code language um, <laughs> of the week code. Okay. Katie. Uh, yeah, I I appreciate the nuance here. It, when is this when is this going to be up for hearing? Uh, Tuesday the twentieth. Tuesday the twentieth. Okay. Tuesday at ten thirty a.m. So somebody here is going to be able to. Do, should we identify that person now? If the if the motion passes, 
Uh, Assuming, okay. I know that I am okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Pete? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I think this is perhaps one of the most important decisions we will make today. Uh, I'm very worried about whether or not uh, the legislature taking over code making process will result in such a mess of code overall that it will we will just essentially be irrelevant. Uh, you know, the WUI code was a politically very touchy kind of subject. There was a big cry and hue when the fires uh, have occurred uh, in the Yakima Valley uh, and in Spokane. And that can happen with other things, especially with our energy code. As we, this organization gets more and more political, we need to realize that there's going to be more attempts to kind of take over what we do and that the legislature doesn't really have the knowledge and expertise to consider it in the whole that we do. And we have enough problems as it is coming to agreement. So I think we need to make this a very strong statement that we're you know, willing to work with the legislature, but they can't necessarily take over the job of writing code for us. Thank you, Pete. I agree with everything you said, except for I hope this organization refrains from becoming political. So Micah, go ahead. Yeah, I don't want us to really become political either. And that's okay. that's kind of the whole whole point why we need to, you know, not get into this kind of fight and prevent this kind of fight from happening in the future yes. uh, of, of worrying about turf. Okay, perfect. Micah? I appreciate Pete saying that because that is an important part of this. And I'm not sure if that was part of Chael's motion was to um, verbalize the opposition to inclusion of technical code language in, or continuing technical code language in this new bill or modified bill. Um, I would like to see that go away as well as the opposition to our um, limits on authority. Thanks. Um, Todd? I, I agree with I agree with the motion. Um, I think we have to be careful. I mean, our authority is granted by the power of the legislature, so they absolutely can do this. So I think that I think it's important that when we move beyond just informing to an actual opinion, that we are are communicating uh, and helping them on the technical aspects of of it, the that this is best placed in rulemaking within our state rather than in perhaps policy making. Okay. No, I think that's well said. Um, Pete and Katie, you still have your hands up. Katie, you dropped yours. Pete, I don't know if you're... Okay. Shell, you want to bring this back? That was the exact intent, and I guess I didn't state all the reasons why, but I think the big one is where nuanced rulemaking authority should or, or is best placed for making this appropriate for all of the things that we do. So what, what Todd said... Okay, can I make a suggestion that uh, that Stoyan, if you could if you could draft a position letter and then have the legislative committee review it on Monday, make any tweaks, and then uh, uh, I, Todd, I don't know if you're available Monday to testify either in person or remotely. I mean, excuse me, not Monday, but Tuesday. I, I'd be happy to, and, and am available if it's if it's the will of the council. Okay. Uh, Chell, would that um, meet the intent of your motion? Yes, I think, yeah. Uh, sending a letter and testifying, I think, is perfect. Yeah, it's, it's often good to provide both written and oral testimony. Um, so if, uh, if, if Stoyan, if you could draft something, either email it out or, or if we could call a quick meeting on Monday to review it, make sure we're all in agreement on the, on the, uh, the wording. Uh, the legislative committee and then uh have todd be our banner carrier if you're asking me to craft the letter it means you're appreciating my english skill right oh absolutely yes <laughs> okay hi <laughs> point very well taken i'll do it you've got all weekend so yeah thank you very much i will give my <laughs> beer for next week there you go <laughs> okay uh, so that's the motion. Uh, let's uh, all in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, last item on the legislative agenda is 6291. 
Um, Todd, do you want to give a brief overview on that or? Yeah, you know, I think I think story is probably the best position because it, it, it is relevant to our discussion on on our internal policy and so forth. And then the only thing I'll say to that I've said many times in the legislative committee is, is I did, I did see it, I think it went through just now, right? And 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 the language about the having clarity on on the trade associations has, has always been my my comment and concern to raise to the to the council on how that that is defined. If it more specifically, is that appropriate across all 15 of the the council seats that the largest trade association represents those positions? And and it is a question. I'm not stating a position. Sure. Shell? Yeah, and I agree. I think that's one of the challenges. It's trade associations plural. Um, but some positions on the council have no trade association associated with them. So I I think it's I think people could probably reasonably interpret that if there's no trade associations associated with it, it's still valid, but it's still, you know, an incorrect statement. Um, is, is this new language we're referring to? The, the largest oh, yeah. is new. I'm, can you remember what section was that? No, I think it's right, think it's right five, there. Four or five-ish. And, and I'll just, if Chair, if I may, um, yeah. You know, specifically to you know, to um, the manufacture and installation of building materials, which which is the re the representation I I serve. Um, I don't know what that means. I, I, is that choosing a material over another it just be because of sheer size of one of them? I, so I just want to raise that as an example, and I I haven't thought through all the other positions yet. So. This this particular bill has has gotten gone through committee. It's going to be exact on. They're going to vote on it on Wednesday, so there's no more no more time for any comment on it. Um, I mean, obviously, we can always reach out to individual members. Oh, is that? Oh, wait, no. It, it was today, oh, unfortunately. Today. Yeah, and and we had the meeting last month, and it was introduced the same the same. The same day. Uh, everything that we discussed at the, uh, the lunch committee meeting, I was trying to uh, pass the information. Were you able to do that? Well, I was. I was trying to. Yes, uh, but how much of this information was concerned, I don't know. And uh, yesterday, late afternoon, I was approached by Wabo. So we had a discussion. They had some uh, ideas for uh, proposed language, and I did the same. I send it. I send it to the sponsors. Okay. But, okay. Uh, I helped with the with the beginning, but uh, I haven't been involved after uh, the bill was. Approved. So I, you know, everything I get, I just I just pass it to the sponsor staff and the sponsors. And... Okay, Micah. I appreciate Story and putting this bill together. I, I have spoken out against some of it uh, multiple times, but meeting with Stoyan, you know, there are some important parts of this bill. And Stoyan, the question I'm going to have: Did were you able to submit in comment or in writing the two-third vote allowance for the off-cycle rule? Is that what uh, you're? Wobble, Wobble was going to Wobble was going to, Wobble was going to uh, uh, testify today. I don't know why Wobble didn't testify. I don't know if they submitted the comment, but. Uh, I sent uh, uh, two versions yesterday, Wabo, and what we discussed a couple meetings ago, the Ledge Committee meeting. I, I sent it to the sponsors. I sent it to Senator Wilson, and I sent it to a representative from. So, so you did send the the two thirds vote recommendation. It, it, it is the two thirds vote. It is the two thirds vote. Okay. And if if folks aren't aware of what we're talking about, haven't been part of the legislative committee, if Stoyan wants to scroll up. I believe it's section one, item five. Uh, the original bill, uh, item six, I'm sorry. Um, item six, more or less prohibited off cycle rules unless they were directed by the legislator. Um, Stoyan did indicate that his intent was to have that same 
two thirds vote allowance that uh, we have for the emergency rulemaking in this legislation to say the same for the off cycle rulemaking. Um, there's an interpretation that uh, was provided that if it went to emergency rule that it could go to off cycle rule, although this legislation doesn't state that. And if folks know our emergency rule process, you, you get to make the emergency rule stands for 120 days. We're able to extend that as long as we go into permanent rulemaking. But this says we can't go into permanent rulemaking in an off cycle if it's not directed by legislature. So there were some concerns there. So that's why we requested that Stoyan put in or, or look to put in that two thirds vote allowance on the off cycle rule um, and not just directed by the legislature. Yeah, I think that was the, uh, the connection. In, I talked to Mike uh, a few times and we, we had this at the Ledge Committee uh, meeting. So what I didn't add, the intent was to add, to clarify the two thirds here, the emergency rules also to make the connection to the uh, off cycle rule. And I didn't provide it. However, uh, reading the language, uh, if I had the two thirds here, it will be even, even less, more restrictive for the off cycle rule. Currently, and I discussed this with Dirk, and I'll ask him, Dirk, sorry to put you on the, on the spot here, but uh, the connection the connection between the emergency rule and off-cycle rule. So the understanding was that, and this is why it refers to 3405-350, you have an emergency rule, and 3405-350 uh, specifically states why the emergency rule uh, and how the emergency rule can be enacted. And you enact the emergency rule because you don't have time to follow the regular process. And the emergency rule is uh, effective for 120 days because the assumption is during that time, the council or whatever entity will start with the uh, permanent adoption. So at the beginning, uh, especially I myself, I didn't, uh, I didn't feel it was necessary to make the direct connection. So there were several ideas for this two thirds for the off cycle rule. One was here, uh, clarifying that off cycle amendment to any of the Washington state building codes may be initiated and implemented at any time if directed by the legislature, legislature or two thirds. This was a wobble uh, proposal. The second one was to add it here make some connection between the emergency rule and off cycle rule, which again, I, I didn't feel it was necessary, but I may be wrong. And the last one was the interim code adoption cycle and to add another sentence and say that, you know, with two thirds, the council can initiate uh, uh, a rule that uh, is a, a substantive amendment. But everything we discussed was sent out so the, the sponsors give this information. Okay. Todd? Uh, page five, line 19 was the reference to the largest trade association. Last, gotcha. last Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Todd, can I say something about that real quick, the, the largest? That's not a big change. I mean, it's a substantial change from current law, but really all the legislature would be doing there would be adding the term largest into it. So those questions that you surfaced regarding what is the, who's the trade association and does it apply to what industry? Those are actually, uh, those are questions under current law, right? So if there's a criticism here, it would be that this legislation doesn't go take a step to actually clarify that further. The, the issue of largest doesn't necessarily change uh, those underlying questions in, in my view. Um, when the largest was added to the bill, uh, uh, I was with Dan Larson at the time and we, we, we raised the concern. I know that this was discussed last year when uh, during that lost lawsuit. So again, the information was uh, available for, for the sponsor. So it's not, you, you think it's Torrance bill, but it's not. I, I think if I may ask a clarifying question, I don't know what that means for a position like mine that represents dozens of trade associations. How does that create preference over a building material 
over another one because a certain building material has more market share? Is that what we're saying? That that should then be preferenced? And so I, I and I don't know where else that might apply to other positions. I think it's very clear in some of the sectors are very specific. Architecture is an example. Home builders is an example that was in the in the litigation. So right. I don't think it's always clear in the other ones. It's a, it's a really good point. And I think that the, simply the, the what the, the bill would do is reflects the current practices of there are nominations that are made to the governor's office by trade associations. So that's exi that exists under current law. And then this would simply clarify that it has to be the largest trade association. What that actually would mean in practice it would have to be, at first, it would have to be uh, assessed by the governor's office as to what their understanding of what that means. And and I I would say then personally I I don't support that 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 would give a you know potential for equal representation across you know the many different the diversity of of manufacturers and installers of and suppliers and suppliers yeah thank you yeah okay uh, Roger yeah I'm looking at it and trying to figure out if or how it applies to structural engineering, we are a profession, not a trade. So I would almost suggest that that doesn't apply to structural engineering. As far as who would replace me. Um, however, I also know that uh, SEAW, which is one, is the largest probably in the state of Washington, uh, representing the structural engineering profession. Um, did make requests last time and but they weren't aware that they were supposed to it was it was kind of uh you know as the process came about they figured out that oh yeah we should recommend somebody so again it seems pretty it doesn't seem very clear if they're trying to clarify it it doesn't seem like it's very clear to me um two other quick points number one if we're going to start talking about two thirds for anything, I sure hope we're clarifying what two thirds vote is. Is it two thirds of the voting members, two thirds of the votes cast, two thirds of the votes of the people present? So we've been down that road. I suggest we don't muddy the waters anymore. And if anything, we can clarify it. And third, um, I am on vacation and I've already taken an hour more of my time than I had told my wife I would. So I am going to have to log off here. So. See you all soon. <laughs> Roger, Jerry, Roger. The two the two third the, the language in the bill, and this was suggested by uh Dirk and Dave Merchant. Uh it's two thirds of the voting members, and this is how uh it's been interpreted before. It just was clarifying. Uh, I guess the assumption was that uh the bill wouldn't create something new. It was clarifying that it's two thirds of the vote, voting. Yeah. Roger, thank you for uh, taking time out for us today. I hope you're someplace nice and sunny. You bet. Okay. Um, okay. Is there any any further action to be taken on uh, 6291? I think we've done what we can do, and we'll see how it uh, shakes out in the end. Um, Todd, do you have anything else to add? For oh, the thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It is 3.08. Let's... Uh, let's Let's take five minutes or so. Let's come back at 3.15 and see if we can uh, speed through the rest of the agenda. What is on the rest of the agenda? Does the building code, of, oh, I'll show it. <laughs> Let me just read it. <laughs> yeah, you read it to me, I'll try to understand. Okay, I hope everyone's back. Um, wow, Micah couldn't wait to get his hand up. So go ahead, Micah. Uh, I appreciate it. I have a hard stop at 3.50. My my son qualified for the high school state swim meet. Um, so I need to ask my question uh, before, I, before I have to sign off. And I don't know if we'll get to other business by then. But I wanted to clarify from Derek and, and Stoyan, uh, since we did go through the WUI code and possible legislation that will occur, the question has come up for many jurisdictions as to whether or not our adopted and amended 2021 Wildland Urban Interface Code would apply if the current legislation that is being proposed does go into effect. 
Um, so would you be able to provide information on that today for us? Yeah, I'm going to jump in real quick. So you're asking specifically, Micah, whether if Senate Bill 6120 passes, would the code provisions that have been adopted by the council for this code cycle, would those adopt, would those uh, be effective? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to speak for myself. I think the answer to that is no. And the reason for that is uh, 6120 is, is very um, directive as to what authority the council has to adopt codes. This is obviously what we were talking about before and one reason why uh, the council feels very strongly about weighing in on uh, that specific bill um, because the, the bill would expressly limit the authority of the council to uh, only a handful, to adopt statewide standards for only a handful of, of uh, sections of the WUI. Those sections that were adopted by the council as amendments uh, to the WUI I think would, if it went to court, would likely be deemed to be outside of the authority of the of the uh, uh, SBCC and, and accordingly, um, the SBCC um, should, if the bill passes, take steps to, uh, to be clear about what the effect of, of those additional provisions are. And I, I wanna note that that bill does have an emergency clause, so it goes into effect as soon as it's signed. Yeah. So obviously being signed is is different than, um, you know, when, when signing die occurs. So that could happen sometime after March 15th. Uh, and obviously the governor could could take steps to veto it too. We, we, as we've been saying, we don't know what the future looks like. But if that bill is signed and go, goes into effect, uh, there would be questions right away. I think we really uh, good legal questions as to whether the existing code provisions are enforceable. I appreciate that information and, and thank you for letting me jump ahead. Again, I saw I'm have to sign off in about 20 minutes or so, thanks. Congratulations, by the way. Okay, item number 11, council opinion. Does the Washington State Building Code apply to manufactured homes? That's really easy, the answer is no. But and, 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 uh, <laughs> let me clarify that. The, it says council, council opinion, it's a little, little misleading. What I was thinking about was, can the council staff add the message to the uh, SBCC website and saying that uh, we'll figure out the language, but uh, whether or not the council adoption of the building code uh, is applicable to manufactured homes. And I, I sent you uh, a dear opinion on this, and we, we had a conversation, very helpful, I think, with Micah to understand his point of view as a, a, a representing a building officials. And uh, dear, clarify with uh, a follow-up email that uh, he he meant the council authority to adopt codes for uh, manufactured homes. So uh, I don't have this opinion posted because it was sent under uh, attorney-client communication, but I send it to our council members. So I, I, I assume you are familiar with uh, uh, his personal opinion and, and why. Yeah, and I'm going to say something real quick about, uh, I provided that to, to Stoyan and, and in, in turn to the council members as an analysis uh, from me at Stoyan's request. You know, when I communicate with clients, I just want to make sure that uh, that information is confidential. The conclusions from from that are, are part of the analysis is certainly fair uh, to make public on a website or however the, the council deems is appropriate. So it's not my privilege, it's the council's privilege. Uh, but uh, uh, we I always try to be careful when I'm communicating legal analysis to, to the council and council staff that I, I do so under the uh, confidentiality rules that govern my profession. Okay. Uh, Micah, do you have something further on that? No, I appreciate Derek and Stoney taking the time with that uh, response. Uh, in it dealt with uh, some of the codes and specifically a legislative bill um, that was going to exempt manufactured homes from the WUI code. And Dear, could you expand on how that would affect individual jurisdictions? I, I know we asked that question, are you able to share that information? And again, I, I don't know where I can go with the attorney-client privilege email information yeah, well, yeah, me, and what we can me. discuss here today. So. Yeah, and, and just for members of the public who are, are watching, I'm saying, what's this all about? You know, there there was a bill uh, that 
uh, Swain, if you don't mind, I mean, you can speak a little bit more to the bill, but there was a bill, and I can't recall the number which was introduced, which would ex have ex had the effect of expressly exempting manufactured homes uh, from uh, the WUI code. And naturally, questions arose from folks who said, well, I thought manufactured homes would already be exempt from the WUI code, right? Because the manufactured homes are um, regulated under what I'll call a national building code, namely the HUD, uh, the HUD standards, which are adopted under federal statute. Um, and so, you know, we've been having some conversations about what the scope of those standards are. And, and uh, the, the precise question was, can the SBCC write statewide codes that have the effect of dictating different safety standards or construction standards for factory built manufactured homes that are sold in Washington state? And the answer to that is no. Uh, and that's clearly set forth under the federal preemptive statute, but then also to uh, LNI's um, own authority here, the labor uh, and industries, Department of Labor and Industries has uh, exclusive authority in the state to set statewide uh, health and safety standards for, um, for manufactured homes. Now I'm talking about health and safety construction standards, right? I'm not talking about things like, um, you know, the defensible space, around a manufactured home. I'm not talking about outbuildings. I'm not talking about uh, potential rules with respect to um, uh, fixtures that are attached to a manufactured home. Simply talking about the construction and installation of the homes which are governed under state and federal law. I don't think that's a, a particularly controversial opinion or insight. I think this is well established, but those questions were surfacing because of uh, uh, questions regarding a, a specifically pertaining to the buoy. Uh, and that's that's what we've been talking about. Micah asked uh, a, a question regarding the, th the authority of local jurisdictions. And, and the answer to that is, is under state law, local jurisdictions do have additional authority uh, to regulate uh, manufactured homes in, in certain respects um, uh, with regarding sites uh, and, and some other uh, specific uh, requirements. Not with regard to the construction though, uh, or safe or safety requirements that are you know established uh, under the federal and state standards, uh, and those are preemptive again. Uh, and I, I understand on the ground, it's very easy for me to say this as an attorney and reading the statute, right? On the ground, there might be you know specific questions. Oh well, is this local authority? Is this state or federal authority? I get that, but generally speaking, right? The overview is if it's a installation standard or a construction standard with respect to safety. Uh, those are going to be dictated by the the federal um, the federal code standards, HUD code, and or uh, LNI standards. Did that answer your question, Micah? I'm not prepared to do a deep dive into what local <laughs> authority, local jurisdictions' authority specifically is, but but I do want folks to be mindful that local jurisdictions do have authority with regard to some aspects of uh, the regulation of manufactured homes. No, that, that is helpful. And I think that's probably helpful in context on um, why this is on the agenda. I didn't put this on the agenda, folks, just so you know. <laughs> um, and, and that interpretation come up came up from the legislation, not from something that I was involved in. But um, what Derek did point out it, it previously is there is other authority for local jurisdictions to regulate some things. Um, and that is afforded in various RCWs of 1935.21 and, and subsequent numbers from that. But uh, so, so just want to specify that what Derek is saying is specific to the SBCC and not local jurisdictions and that interpretation there, um, because jurisdictions do have the authority to determine their seismic design, um, wind loads, things like that, snow loads that are not set by the State Building Code Council. And those things definitely will apply among others. And some of that information is, of course, uh, provided in those RCWs regulating those uh, RCW 35.21. So, yeah, if, if for that. the record, Mike, uh, I've got RCW 35.21.684, RCW 35A.21.312, and RCW 36.01.225 for those who are keeping score at home. Perfect. Thank you for that. And, uh, that was just my questions on this, and and I didn't. I don't know if there's uh, other folks that need to weigh in from the public on this, or if Stoyan has more on it. But I appreciate it. The question does come about is is whether or not we will allow this to be public. It sounds like certain things will. I don't know, dear, who would write that up to provide that on the website if that's between you and Stoyan. I'm, I'm happy to work with staff. 
on on how best to, to okay write. i would support putting that on the website if that's what we need to vote on today as an action thank you okay joe i guess along the same lines what action is can we take today often we have a written thing and we say yes or no to it um or modify the language i'm i guess in support of that opinion but i don't know what this what steps staff is hoping i i would make a motion to say yes but i i feel like there's probably more that needs to happen other than that so i defer to staff or, or anyone else who knows more about this what could happen today based on this so and do you need action from the council uh not necessarily um if if you're okay with this uh, with this message again the plan was for a simple message without too many details uh, and uh, I'll, I'll coordinate with dear just to specify that this is not in general this is related to the state building code council's authority to adopt standards related to manufactured homes it's a simple message because uh, uh, i had several meetings with uh, uh, manufactured homes manufacturers and we all understand their issue they have uh, uh, you know uh, rebuilt uh, homes for worth millions of dollars and uh, they needed this quality and uh, i also had communications with uh, wabo and you know mike mike clearly uh, explained what the issues uh, with the enforcement are so we the plan was just to, a simple message to say this doesn't apply to manufactured homes okay i will make a motion then to um to support the opinion that uh the building code council does not regulate manufactured homes. I don't even know if that's necessary. So, and do you, do you need, uh, I'll go back to my question. Do you need action by this body? It, it's up to you. I, I don't need an action, but uh, if you want to vote on it, of course, it's your right. But if you want to go on the we, record, shall we can do that? I guess, do we? You don't need action. I, opinions usually need a motion, don't they? Yeah, but this is not a formal council opinion <laughs> based on a request by uh, uh, court okay. officials. I, I'll, I'll, I'll rescind my motion then. I'll withdraw my motion. Let's, let's, dear, do you think we will need to vote on this? Uh, unless there's a dissenting point of view on this, I think Damon's initial answer, no, is uh, the right way to move forward. And uh, we okay. could leave it at that. I'll just ask the council members, does anybody have an opinion contrary to what we've discussed? Okay, hearing none, moving on to item number 12. Uh, update to opinion 2305. So in uh, 2023, the council issued an opinion on IV or IRC, I'm sorry, that's miss, uh, it's not correct. It's IRC section 330.7 which has to do with adult family homes. Uh, the question came about, uh, about fire apparatus access roads and how they apply. What you see here is the opinion that was issued in uh, 2023. And I had another jurisdiction contact and ask about this particular section and how it applies to residential structures that are converted without any sort of um, a physical change there's like somebody buys a house wants to put an adult family home in it and just moves people in without any modification and so what you see here is the draft uh answer that i prepared in conjunction with the jurisdiction that was asking which is the city of auburn and instead of making it a separated opinion i uh, drafted it to supersede 2305 and just be additive to it and in here, they're asking, do, does 330.7 require adult family homes to comply with the local standards for water supply and fire apparatus access? And is this section applicable to existing structures converted to an adult family home use without physical modifications? And the answer that I prepared for the council to consider today is yes, it does apply to all adult family home uses. And that's based on the reading of section R330.1, 
And it says this section shall apply to all newly constructed adult family homes and all existing single family homes being converted to adult family homes. So originally, uh, the first jurisdiction of Sumner asked if you had like a landlocked property that didn't necessarily have the fire apparatus access or the water supply provided to it, could they have an adult family home there? And we said that yes, every adult family home has to have this, but those standards are regulated by the jurisdiction and not by the State Building Code Council. And in this one, I thought it was pretty clear that 330.1 indicates that yes, the standards apply, but it's gonna be up to the jurisdiction to decide how their own regulations are applied in each individual case. Okay, that sounds fair. Joe? Yeah, the opinion seems reasonable to me. Um, the code at the top says 2018 International Residential Code. Is that the code that the person is asking about this time as well? Um, well, they're asking about does a specific... apply to the 2021 as well. Uh, I the reason I drafted it for 2018 and not just for International Residential Code is because the last time we had an opinion that was spanning multiple codes that the, it was kind of called into contention. So they're asking about a specific project and currently the 2018 is in effect and that is why I drafted it this way. Okay, thanks. Micah? Thanks. I, yeah, the 2018 kind of throws a little bit of a wrench in there just because there's some language in the scoping section of R102.7.1 for 2021 that talks about uh, if it's an alteration or something to that structure um, that causes the use or activity to be changed to one not within the scope of the IRC, that it would have to use provisions from the IEBC. Um, I, I guess my question is, would that affect this answer and determination especially answer number two, where the IRC would apply to all adult family home uses. Um, is that the actual case if you are triggered or kicked over to the IEBC or the IBC in some other way, shape or form? So I, I do have a little concern with it overall. I think you're, you're, you're close to correct, but I think some changes could be made there. And I'm sorry, I haven't had enough time to evaluate all those, but that would be a question based on scoping of the IRC moving forward. Thanks. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to uh, approve this for the 2018 code? Shell? I guess I, yeah, I, I get what Mike is saying. And he's, and the answer too says the IRC section 330.7 applies to all adult family home uses. I guess um, it doesn't apply to all adult family home uses because they might not be under the IRC in the first place. Um, but it could say to all adult family home uses under the IRC. Um, and if it said that, then I would make a motion to um, approve this opinion with that slight modification. So you're wanting to modify answer two to say under the IRC after the word uses? Correct. Dustin, does that work for you? Yes, it works for me. Okay. I'm pulling up the uh, Word document here and we'll put that in there. Okay. Uh, with that, is, was that a motion to accept, Joe? Motion to accept the opinion with that modification, yep. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Let me just uh, show the, the quick draft and make sure that I can hit the mark appropriately. But we trust you 100%. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, item number 13, uh, tag seats for the 2024 adoption cycle. I want to ask the council to table this agenda item for the meeting in, in March. Okay. Uh, somebody want to make a motion to that effect? I move that we table this until the meeting in March, okay. as requested by staff. I'll second it. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Chell? I, I would like to speak. Um, I I brought up something during uh, items not on the agenda, and it was suggested to move to this one. And um, 
I would like to have that as part of the agenda today, which is to discuss the the um, end date for applications for the tags that was put out earlier. Right now it's February 25th. And I'm thinking if we if we are not selecting people for the tags until March 15th, which is our next meeting, then we could extend that date to um, March 8th for the applications for tags due. We've never, um, reasons being we've never tried to go out for dozens of new tag members at the same time as we are now um, and getting people to uh, finding the right people and getting the right people to um, get permission from their employers to do this is just not an easy task for all the positions. I emailed Stoyan earlier today and, um, you know, they haven't received that many applications yet. Um, so I'd rather we extend the time and get lots of the right applications and then we can make decisions as a council on the 15th. It wouldn't delay our process, I don't think to have applications due a little bit later. Um, so I want to cover that today and I'll make a motion to do that. But the motion right now is to table and I don't, I'm going to speak against the motion to table because I want to bring that up today. Um, okay. I'm, uh, Micah, go ahead. I made a motion to table yet. I think it was a request. However, I want to support Chael in the extension of the date I know that we've done significant outreach and I've seen some start to pop up, but that only leaves about nine days left before the application period closes. So I think an extension is warranted, but I don't think a motion was made for tabling this item yet. So I think your motion to move the date would be appropriate, Joe. Yeah, and, and we can also move the date under other business. I'm happy to hear that. that okay. Motion. Does Shell want to make a friendly amendment to my motion? <laughs> I would accept that. Yeah, because the motion to table was already made, I believe. Yeah, I made it. Yeah, that's, let's, let's, I missed it. Well, I, I apologize. I missed it. Thank you. Hold on. So uh, let's let's motion to table is a privileged motion. Let's not, and I, I don't think it can be amended. Okay. Uh, we'll entertain your motion afterwards, Jill. I could make it under other business if that was acceptable. That would be fine. Yes. Okay. Okay. All in favor of tabling this to, to next meeting, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Chell? I'd like to uh, um, make a motion to direct staff to uh, have the end date for the first round of tag applications that is currently February 25th to have that read March 8th um, for the reasons I stated a few minutes ago. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second that. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing just to clarify, to clarify that this uh, uh, will be related to the uh, revisions to the uh, uh, schedule for the 2024 code adoption cycle. I, it shall email me, uh, you know, this question, and I sent him back how many uh, applications we've received, and we don't have very many. And uh, the, yeah, so two months late or three months late, that doesn't make any difference. Okay. Okay. Did I did I call the vote on that? Not yet. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um under new business, uh the chair has a few items. Um and I had meant to get a list of dates together. I have them in front of me. They're just kind of jumbled. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven meetings remaining for the year. Um, I looked into the Open Public Meetings Act, and there's nothing that precludes uh, a council or a committee from having in-person meetings be mandatory. They do have to be made available electronically for other attendees. I would like to propose that we dedicate at least three of the seven remaining meetings to in-person meetings. Um, I don't wanna shove that down everybody's throat. I kinda like to get everybody's feel on it. Um, anybody got any, any thoughts? You know, we, a lot of us have been meeting together now for two years and have never met in person. Um, we know that, it, and I, I commend the people that drove to, to be in Olympia today there are little tiny dots on our screen, on our you know, little little dots at the table. You can't see who's who. So 
would love to love to pick pick three meetings and have us you know spread it out around the state and uh, meet in person. Joe, I think that's a great idea, and it, you know to your point, I think everybody has to be there, or else it just is not as useful if you have half or two, even two thirds of the people there. So um, I'm in support of picking three meetings and and attending. Okay. Um, and we're, we essentially have a meeting each month starting, you know, obviously uh, March 15th. We don't have a meeting in July and August. So I don't know if anybody has a preference. I'd kind of like to do every other one. Maybe we keep March 15th online and then we do April june and october so pete yeah i i'm opposed to this if you'll notice that i'm in my recliner uh for sitting through a meeting this long for that i it's physically just basically impossible for me to attend those meetings uh you know that would be a major hardship uh i would have to you know if it's not in the Tri-Cities, uh, I would have to get a hotel room. That would be a major imposition. I don't know if you've ever tried to get from your knees onto a hotel bed without using your feet, but that's what I have to do, essentially. Uh, so I am very much against this. Uh, I can attend and, and participate in these fully, uh, but, uh, and while I would love to have, uh, you know, meet all you guys and get together for maybe one one meeting, uh, that would be fine, but not three. Okay. I was going to offer to bring you a recliner, but uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's additional difficulties as well. So, Well, then everybody would require a recliner, I think. They'd be jealous. <laughs> I, I'm not opposed to that either. <laughs> uh, Micah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm on the fence. I, I understand the need. I would. I, I almost tried to attend in person today. Um, I, I do think the scheduling will be tough for a lot of folks. I, I know that I'm going to be attending the ICC code hearings for two weeks in April and two weeks in October. And I think they are right around the SBCC meetings um, along with other things that will make it difficult. I will try, but I think trying to make that mandatory, um, maybe it's just something we coordinate among the council members and not actually get a vote for mandatory attendance. Um, just maybe try to schedule a few dates that may work for most and make it happen that way. Thanks. Okay. Any other thoughts? Like I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to play King here. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, I, I think uh, it is important for us to meet and, and, you know, I'm a very social individual. I, you know, think it would be a great deal of fun to, to meet many of you in, in person and, you know, something I didn't add earlier, you guys are one of the most impressive professional groups I've ever had the honor to work with. And so meeting you in person would be, a, you know, just just a lot of fun. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, it's it's a heck of a stress on many of us, especially those of us who are far distant from the meeting. And so let, let's shoot for one, maybe, but I can't do much more than that. Okay. I, I think uh, what I may do is uh, propose three, uh, not make it a mandatory thing, and ensure that at least one is in Tri-Cities. I would go for that. Okay. Perfect. All right. That was one item I had. Um, another thing is uh, I think going forward, I'm going to try to go to timed agendas. You know, we do pretty good at getting through things, and it looks like we're going to wrap up on time today unless there's a whole bunch of other business. But uh, if there's no op no uh, opposition, it's something at, at the national level, at all the national meetings I attend, we switch to timed agendas and it just seemed to run more efficiently. Does it mean you're, we're locked in or we stop discussion? No, it just kind of helps people keep on track. So that's something you expect to see next meeting. Um, somebody brought up the idea of, should we consider uh, having a parliamentarian uh, as part of this council? Anybody have any thoughts on that? I mean, we 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 dump a lot on Derek, and, and uh, while he's he's pretty darn good, he, he admittedly admits that parliamentary procedure is not his uh, main uh, focus of study. Shell. I'm raising my hand, Damon. Okay. Oh, <laughs> let's see. I couldn't see. Go for it. So, what exactly does a parliamentarian do for us that Derek isn't doing? And is it something we would have to find budget for? Uh, I 
Derek, I think the the idea might have been yours. It was either you or Stoyan or both. Well, it sure it sure wasn't me uh, <laughs> because I, I'm not going to suggest that the uh, people not listen to me anymore. But um, uh, but, but I mean, just to, to echo. So part of what's going on here, uh, and you know, we've we've struggled off and on over the last year, couple of years, um, with difficult, challenging, contentious issues sometimes, and then questions regarding Robert's rules. And when things are going smoothly, Robert's rules, maybe people don't pay as much attention to. And then when things, you know, are a little more contested, hey, you know, what does Robert's rules say on this? And uh, the, the council by its bylaws has elected to be governed um, by Robert's rules, the, specifically the 11th edition. And that's up to you. So if if you want to be run by Robert's rules, then you know to Damon's point, there are correct ways of doing that. Uh, and I do my best if issues arise during or prior to a meeting to weigh in and provide my point of view. Um, and we saw an iteration of that right when we were having these complex parliamentary discussions regarding you know a motion to amend and, and all the rest of the stuff from a prior meeting. So I certainly uh, I'm happy to continue to try to provide my opinion on Robert's rules if the council believes that there there is a need to have uh, maybe somebody who uh, does this professionally or is is better trained in it. There's ways that. Potentially, a member of the council could be in that position. You know, staff, me. We, we could talk about what that looks like if the council thinks there's a need. And, and then there are, of course, people who can offer those services. I don't know anything about that. What the costs are, but uh, but that exists in the marketplace too. And, and you know, quite frankly, I'm 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 pretty efficient in it, and uh, so you know, I can I can take advantage of all of you for, by not having a problem hearing because you're going to believe I know what I'm talking about. But uh, <laughs> that's that's been my prerogative. What are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Chell, go ahead. Yeah, I think if we did five minutes of training one time on what Robert's Rules actually says, there's a couple of cheat sheets out there, and I look at them all the time, and I think that's useful. Um, maybe on like CR 103 meetings, we need somebody to show up that has a whole lot of experience, but I think for for 90% of our meetings, if we just look at Robert's rules for five minutes, look at the cheat sheets, I think we, we got everything we need. Yeah, and, I, and I've gone much deeper than the cheat sheets and usually have the book on my desk. Uh, it's, it's, I think we're, we're, you know, we're making big decisions. So, Micah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm kind of torn on the, the parliamentary decision there. And, and I do agree with Chell. Maybe it's appropriate at some meetings or maybe necessary. But overall, I, I think we cover it pretty good. And I agree with the cheat sheets. That's where I go to, even though sometimes I miss things. Um, but I, I want to go back to the timed agenda. We kind of went over that. And you said that's going to occur. I have some concerns on who's determining that time and, and where it lays out. Um, I tried to move some items at the beginning of this meeting to later in the meeting in order to do business that many folks, many, you know, public folks were on for. And it was indicated, oh, these items won't take long. And they took an hour and 40 minutes. Sure. So there was a lot of folks on that sat there for an hour and 40 minutes waiting to get to these other items that were, were more important to the, to I think those folks that were on other than the, the tag makeup or the, or the information on the bylaws at the moment. So I, I, I'm not sure who sets the time for that timed agenda. But I have some concerns that um, where that ends up and, and how that lays out, even if it is flexible, uh, I'm not sure that's the right path to take, especially when we, you know, when things that seemingly would take a short amount of time don't. So that's my concern on that. Thanks. If I follow up on Micah, uh, I apologize, Jay. I'll be, I'll be quick uh, for the agenda. So I'm trying to pause the agenda uh, between a week and 10 days uh, before the meeting. And if council members have issues with the agenda, please let me know. Uh, I'll discuss with the chair. But, it, it, you know, usually this requests for uh, overturning the agenda are happening at, at the council meeting. So, you know, when something is posted and everybody's expecting it, and then we get to the meeting and the agenda is just reorganized, that is not helping everybody. So. Again, the main reason for posting the agenda early is just to get some feedback from council members. I can agree with you on that in the agenda. 
However, there are times when you post the agenda without the supporting documents. So I can't estimate how long things are going to take until closer to the meeting. I, and maybe you're trying to work on that. But again, I, maybe we let this process play out a little further before we automatically jump to a timed agenda or at least have some input on what that looks like and who is determining the time for each item. Thanks. If, if we have council meetings quarterly, then I can I can post the materials as well uh, one month early. But if we have six hours meetings every month, I can't do that. And uh, to answer your question, you know, as as the person now approving the agenda before it's posted, I would probably be the one dictating the time. Um, as as chair, I can I can limit discussion as we as we have it right now. So I could effectively control the time. I don't like to do that. I'd like to keep it as fluid as possible. I just I was going to do it more as a guideline, kind of a, something to help us try to get through our agenda items, and and try to conclude in our six hour time slot. Jay? I think that's good. I, I, I don't have any issues with that. I think maybe instead of doing the entire agenda, maybe we start with timed comment periods. I know that's something ICC implements where it's a two minute limit mm -hmm. on your testimony and it gets cut off. Um, and maybe that's the same we need to do for council members. But again, I hate, I enjoy robust discussion, but uh, I think there needs to be some parameters around what we're trying to do there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I have to drop off. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day and a great weekend. Good luck. Thanks. Jay? Uh, thank you. Going back to the discussion on parliamentarian, I remember last meeting on Robert's rules. I bought it too. They must, they must be getting a lot of business from SBCC members uh, trying to get up to speed on this. Um, I would support um, Chell's suggestion on training. Um, there is somebody that uh, Cities and counties have worked with an uh, organization called Jurassic Parliament that does uh, training that's high, I would highly, highly recommend. And, you know, if there was some <laughs> ability to make that available for uh, SBCC members, I, I think that is uh, an investment much better spent than a parliamentarian. I'm satisfied with the uh, support we're getting from Derek on this. Thanks. I think uh, I think Jurassic Parliament's out of visit bar, aren't they? Or is that the, per the company in his club? I don't know where that they're from, but Anne McFarland uh, is the registered parliamentarian that I've attended a couple of trainings with, and she's just fantastic. She is, yeah. And I, I don't think we need, you know, maybe with a host of new members, we need some basic. I have no desire to go through basic training again. I've, I've done that. Um, but it, just, it was just a thought. Threw it out there. Katie, we will research the training, and we'll send you two or three cheat, cheat sheets. Perfect. <laughs> okay, Katie, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say to the parliamentarian thing, I, I don't think we can uh, kind of uh, parliamentarian our way ourselves out of these tough issues that we have to deal with. And so um, I'm I'm pretty impressed with the level of what we have right now. And I know that it, it could always be better, but, you know, uh, I, I, I agree with what, what's coming out of this. And also, I like the idea of a time um, on the agenda. If it's kind of couched as a like, this is what we expect it to take, what we what we hope it'll take, and uh, just to give an outline to the day, so that because uh, I I know there's agenda items that I look at sometimes and I think, oh, that'll go fast, and you know, three hours later. So, but even an expectation of it's going to take two and a half, that helps round off my expectation and hopefully the public's as well. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to give it a try. Nothing set in stone. Um, is Stoyan, do you need much time for staff report? Uh, I will table it for the next time. Okay, is there anything hot? Uh, no, just uh, I was planning to let you know that we are uh, discussing different options for the 2024 code adoption cycle, how to show the changes uh, to the documents, but uh, it will need more than five minutes, so okay. I'll, I'll table it for March. Okay. Um, is there any other uh, older new business or anything for the good of the order? Okay. Hearing none, uh, those who made the trip to Olympia, um, I'm going to go to 1889 downtown, the new restaurant, and uh, first round's on me, so if you're in town.
Maybe in 1889. See, you should come to the meetings. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Does it include staff because we are fully staffed here? Oh, you bet. I, I got it. I got everybody. Thank you. I'll, I'll be there by four thirty. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, appreciate your help and your input and, and your time commitment. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, sure. Thank Thank you. Why is my staff's stamina?